Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, if you're joining us for the first time, oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, I have my own phone on, so it's an echo right there. If you're joining us for the first time, thank you for joining us. If you've been to our Saturday lectures before, you know this is a different setup for us. Um, so we're trying, we've done some webinars over the past year, but we haven't done any lectures this way and we are just thrilled with the turnout. So we hope you enjoy this way. Although it's um, a little bit nicer to see people in person, we're still glad that we're able to offer them some way through technology. Um, we are going to start with Dr. Kristen Whitney today and she will, introduce herself and share her screen to give her presentation. And then uh, we're gonna switch up the schedule a little bit from what I had posted. We're gonna do a presentation question and answer for that presenter. And then Nicole will go question and answers for her. Sarah question and answers in a wrap up. And you can um, ask questions via the chat at the bottom of your screen and I will read them or the presenter will read them off and address them as best they can. Okay, can everybody hear me and see my screen? Give a thumbs up if you can, please. Stacy, can you hear me and see my screen? Okay, um, great. So, um, hi, I'm um, Dr. Kristen Whitney. I am um, a sports medicine physician at the um, Boston Children's Hospital Division of Sports Medicine. Um, and um, I, running is one of the great loves in my life. I love running marathons um, and being a part of helping support my patients in running marathons. So I'm excited to talk about this specific topic with you all today. Um, Okay, so first of all, in terms of financial disclosures, um, really nothing of note. I, um, as part of my involvement with the Boston Athletic Association Running Club, we do get a little bit of financial support from Adidas. That being said, I will not be trying to endorse any shoe wear for anyone today. Otherwise, I have no relevant financial disclosures. Okay. And my other disclosure is that um, although I'm slated to go first, I really feel that my um, colleagues and friends, Nicole and Sarah today, are offering um, really what I, I view as the core and most important information for any um, runner as they are gearing up to um, conquer the marathon. The um, nutrition aspect and the strength aspect is absolutely critical. So I really look forward to hearing their components of the presentation as well. So just a little bit about me briefly. So um, I got into running when I was um, in my high school years. I was involved at the University of Notre Dame in club running actually, which um, uh, introduced me to long distance races and where I started running uh, marathons during my senior year in college. Um, I later went on to um, become a coach for Girls on the Run, um, a wonderful uh, youth development organization for young girls in the Boston area. Um, during med school, I co-founded a um, really fun community running group um, that's based out of Jamaica Plain called Forest Hills Runners. Um, have that on your radar if anyone's ever interested in joining group runs once that is safe again. Um, and um, once I came to the Boston area, I began um, running with the Boston Athletic Association Running Club as part of their kind of marathon um, team. And um, more recently, I have um, become part of um, the medical side of the marathon, so part of the, the medical committee for the Boston Marathon. And I'm um, in my role uh, as a physician at Boston Children's. I've um, uh, enjoyed being involved in our injured runners clinic, taking care of runners, and um, been involved in biomechanics research um, for the running population through my role um, with the injured runners clinic and the running program. Um, for, as far as my marathon resume, I've, um, I've now completed about 12 marathons, Chicago a few times, Boston seven times, that's my real love, as well as New York City and then Sioux Falls, South Dakota as a Boston qualifier, all of which I really enjoyed. I've learned a lot of things the hard way, probably stumbled through every kind of overuse injury um, as many runners have, and I think I've learned a lot through my own running experience that um, I've kind of brought into patient care and my care for runners. Um, on the left side of the screen here, that's me in my first Boston Marathon um, as a college senior. Um, in the middle, that was um, kind of when I was uh, tra training and running with the BAA running club. And then more recently, I've really enjoyed um, a different side of the marathon 
um, serving with my colleagues and friends um, in the medical tent at the finish line, taking care of runners as they come across, um, which is just an absolutely beautiful experience. And I'm really grateful for it. So what are we gonna talk about today? So um, my task is to talk a little bit about um, getting trained for a, a marathon, how to go about that. What about um, 2021 is different for someone looking forward to training with a lot of things. Um, and then we can talk through a couple of different training plans and approach to, to how to um, train for a marathon as well. And I'll try and approach kind of that from a beginner's perspective as well as intermediate and advanced. Um, and then what do, you, what do you do when you think you might have an injury and how do we approach that um, to have everyone running safely? Okay, so 2020 into 2021, um, it's been a crazy year for all of us. Um, I think we've been presented with challenges we never expected. Um, it certainly threw off um, and negated most of our standard uh, running calendars and race calendars. But um, as the vaccine's being rolled out, um, we're all feeling very hopeful and hoping that we see the light at the end of the tunnel. As many of you know, our 2020 Boston Marathon was um, the first ever virtual Boston Marathon. And a lot of folks were able to um, complete their marathon goals virtually this past September, which was just an amazing accomplishment. And then um, for the 2021 Boston Marathon, it is currently slated for um, October 11th, which is so exciting. There's still so many unknowns, of course, with the um, safety of all participants really being at the forefront of everyone's mind. Lots is unknown about the field size, about the exact logistics of the marathon, what's it going to look like, um, and we're all kind of just going to be waiting as we learn more and work with local health officials on um, what makes the most sense for the, the running community and our um, overall Boston community. So uh, marathon training, um, to, to put it in a word, it's, it's a journey, okay? So it's not just an athletic endeavor, it's actually just a life experience, and it's really different for each person. Literally and figuratively, it's a, it's a journey. So um, any runner training um, really grows a lot, I think, both from a physical standpoint and then also socio-emotionally through the process. Every runner has a, a why I run, what's their motivator? You know, some people it's for health, some people it's for um, conquering um, the, the physical challenge, some people it's for running in honor of somebody. And every kind of runner's unique story is so special. And that's why I love it as a, a sport. Um, there's, you know, every runner's experience is really different. And that's based on um, athlete intrinsic factors. So their cardiovascular fitness and endurance, their strength, their nutrition, bone health, and mental health is a big piece of marathon training. And then, um, you know, the extrinsic factors are really important to think of as we um, prepare for marathons ourselves or help um, patients or friends prepare for marathons. No, no runner runs in a vacuum. So there's, um, there's school, work, family, friends, um, sleep, seasonality, training environment, equipment and location access, as we learned this year, all of those play into a runner's specific journey and getting ready for a marathon, not to mention hours in a day, which sometimes um, can be a challenge in itself. So really, I, you know, I think um, the training for marathon is the absolute hardest part of it, okay? I, I'll say this probably four times in this uh, slide deck, but arriving at the start of a marathon healthy and injury-free is 99% of the battle. That's what you got to focus on, okay? Um, get there healthy. Um, the marathon day should really be thought of as a victory lap to celebrate all the hard work that's been put in in getting ready for the race, okay? Um, if you calculate it, and we'll go through some training plans, if you calculate it, um, oftentimes a runner will put somewhere between 500 and 700 miles into their specific uh, training ramp up. And um, the race is 26.2. So about 90, 99% of the, the mileage you're putting um, your body through in the, the marathon experience is all in the training, okay? And then the 26.2 comes after investing all that training. So how long does it take to um, train for a marathon? We'll go through some of the basics here, guys, because I want to kind of um, uh, present a standard training regimen for any beginners in the group. So typical training plan is about 16 to 20 weeks, running somewhere between four and six times a week. Um, other days are spent cross training and um, rest is absolutely key in a, in a runner's preparation. Um, when people ask what type of finishing time should I aim for, a beginner's role is finishing. Okay, finishing healthy, having fun. Okay, that's number one. More experienced runners, people who have, who have one or two races under the belt, then we can start talking about setting goal times. So um, the, I'll run through some different training plans here as examples. Um, these training plans are based on 
um, Hal Higdon's book and training plans marathon, the ultimate training guide, which I think is an awesome resource. It's what I've always gone through, through my athletic career and, and, and a number of experienced runners. I, I also look to Hal Higdon's models. So that's one that I'll kind of discuss through here. I know there's, there are other um, training regimens out here, but I think that this is a good place to start um, in discussion and how to approach this. Okay. So first of all, the novice level one plan, um, who's it for? Beginner runners, people who've not ever run a marathon um, in the past. It can also be a good reference for uh, more experienced runners too, who, who like the kind of distribution of time throughout the week and the distribution of training mileage. It's an 18 week program, okay? Um, week one starts at about 15 miles a week with the maximum mileage ramping up at week 15 for a total of about 40 miles for the week. And then a gradual taper between week 16 and 18 um, with the end goal being marathon day, okay? And we'll kind of walk through what a typical week looks like. So first of all, I think the cornerstone of, of any marathon training program um, is the, the long run component. So long runs for this type of novice training plan, they begin at about six miles and then gradually ramp up to a maximum of 20 miles at week 15 before you start to taper, okay? Um, you'll see days of the week outlined here. The days of the week don't so much matter um, as the kind of relationship between different workouts. Um, but these training plans are modeled um, based on the fact that most people have more time on the weekends to get these types of long runs done. Okay, um, so long runs, uh, typically not on a Saturday. Um, rest days are important. So the, I recommend that a beginner runner um, has at least two days of rest during the day. So typically Monday, Friday, um, rest is a key piece of allowing for muscle regeneration and recuperation um, to keep you healthy and running, okay? The midweek training runs. Um, so there's, there's you know, Tuesday, Thursday runs are, are rather short. Wednesday training runs sort of in the middle of the week, your hump day run um, is gonna be a little bit on the longer side. So it starts at three miles um, and gradually increases over the course of the um, training program to a maximum of 10 miles at that, at that um, peak of week 15 before you start your, your taper on further, okay? Two easy runs a week, um, your Tuesday, Thursday runs are nice, easy, breezy, somewhere between three and five miles, okay? And then the cross-training component is absolutely critical. Um, the cross-training component should be aerobic exercise, so something like swimming, biking, walking, elliptical, something that's fun and mixes it up and uses different muscle groups um, to really round out your fitness program, okay? Um, races built into the marathon training can be really useful in a, a lot of ways. First of all, um, it gives novice marathoners um, the opportunity to experience the, the race environment. Like what's it like to get prepped and go to the race and, and, uh, um, and go through the water stations and all that um, can be really helpful to get an actual race in as part of your, your uh, sort of halfway point in training. Um, and then it also can be a good benchmark for pace calculation for people that are looking for some kind of feedback in terms of you know, how fast um, they're, they're running. Um, it can be a good way to get a, a benchmark. Um, marathon time uh, anticipated is, um, is, is, so there's lots of different calculations, but one way to calculate your anticipated marathon time is your half marathon time times 2.19, okay? Um, there's a lot of different good online calculators. This MacmillanRunning.com has a good um, calculator that adds um, some qualifications for the, um, the difficulty of the half marathon that you complete, but you can use kind of as a, um, a simple measurement uh, that multiplied by 2.19. So how do we approach the, um, the training runs and pacing for our long runs as a novice marathon runner? Um, so running slow is key. And that's actually for every single level. Run your tra long training runs on weekends slow. You should be about 30 to 90 seconds slower than you think your um, marathon pace is going to be. Pace for first timers, just think you want to be comfortable. You want to be conversational. You should be able to have a nice chat with your training partners and, and not feel um, totally exhausted and fatigued at the end of the run. There's no such thing as too slow. And the goal, honestly, is just to finish, okay? Strength training is going to be key. Sarah Collins is going to go over that for us. Um, walking is not only um, acceptable, but almost encouraged as part of your um, long training runs and even during the race. Um, 
well, incorporating periods of time where you're walking briefly strategically can actually help you run healthier. It can help you hydrate better because you're able to drink fluids a little bit more easily when you're walking rather than kind of running and drinking fluids at the same time. Um, and it can be useful to walk when you plan to rather than just walking because you're totally fatigued. Um, some coaches will, will recommend like walking one minute every 10 minutes is one way to go. But, um, in the marathon race, you can kind of just plan to walk at your water stations. Um, Bill Rogers, who is a marathon champion. Um, he is a, there's a historic story where he walked four different times through the marathon and even kind of just sat down, uh, tied his shoe at one point. And then more recently, Doug Linden, who's awesome, um, slowed down substantially almost to a walk, um, while waiting for our other American Chilean Flanagan, um, using the porta potty as part of a, a gesture of uh, teamwork and then also it wasn't bad for her winning race strategy either. Um, so that's kind of our general approach to you know normal gearing up for a marathon. That being said, I will say that 2020 has been crazy. COVID has really negatively impacted physical activity across the country. So a lot of people have just found with gyms being closed, routines are all create all different. Um, a lot of people just are not as active as they they might be at their baseline. So I don't know if anyone this scene looks familiar to anyone, but this is what my house sometimes looks like on Saturday mornings. People are on the couch, you know, masks on, hunkered down. Um, people might not be as active. This is Fitbit data that just shows in the you know last. Uh, March, the total amount of steps per day in, across America greatly decreased after COVID ramped up. So um, it might be a good idea if, you know, you found this year that you're just not as active as usual and you're, you're really would be starting from scratch and preparing for a marathon. Thinking about considering a base program um, with really kind of short distances, a mile and a half to three miles of running, um, some long walks throughout the day, just to get your body moving again and a little bit acclimated um, to movement, weight bearing and impact exercise is not a, a bad idea either. This is a sample of a, um, a 12 week program that's um, just a very gradual ramp up. And again, the idea is slowly adjusting your body um, with an eye towards injury prevention. So don't be afraid to start really early with a really um, gradual program like this. If you found that you've been um, you know, not as active as usual this past year. So um, there are a couple of variations in terms of, um, you know, different approaches based on your experience level with, um, with running marathons. So, so um, if we stratify this um, into what I call, so novice level two, um, people with a running background, so maybe they've finished a marathon or finished a half marathon in the past, they're, they've been running for at least about a year. Um, they're able to comfortably run about three to five miles. Um, and um, they have experience, like I said, with some 5Ks or half marathons in the past. Their training program might look a little bit different from the one I previously presented. So they might um, start with a little bit higher um, long run mileage and they might um, ramp up a little bit more quickly through their long runs on the weekends, okay? And these details are all um, available through Hal Higdon's uh, marathon training website. Um, the sort of law, the sort of long runs, those Wednesday hump day runs um, that I mentioned before, those become not only are they a little bit longer than those easier runs you have on their Tuesdays and Thursdays, but in folks who have more experience with marathons, you might decide to make those training runs actually at your goal marathon pace. Okay. So never will you do your Saturday long runs at your goal marathon pace. That's kind of a no-no, but you can do these shorter midweek runs at a marathon pace just to get your legs used to moving at your goal, goal marathon pace. Okay. Um, intermediate levels again. So folks who have more um, experience with running, um, they're looking to um, beat or improve upon their personal record times. Um, they might use a little bit um, different approach with, um, first of all, longer um, Saturday or Saturday or Sunday runs. Um, these individuals might decide to, um, whereas for the more novice runners, they would typically max out at just one 20 mile run through their marathon training season, a more intermediate level might decide to do two 20 mile runs. So you see a 20 mile run at week 13, a 20 mile run at week 15 with a dip down to this sort of easier 12 mile run in between um, as you know a way to build up a little bit more endurance um, and to build upon their um, you know their their cardiovascular fitness to be able to potentially 
um, reach new personal bests for their, their running times, okay? Um, the other key piece of this is, you know, for stepping up and reaching new, um, new peaks with um, personal bests is, you'll notice this training program actually has a little different setup. So this training program has the athlete running a pace run. So running your marathon pace a little bit faster on the day just before your slow long run. So that gives you the opportunity to practice your long runs on legs that are a little bit more tired. So you're building endurance um, and getting your, your legs ready to, to run a little bit more tired. So that's a, a key difference at this level. Um, and then cross training instead of, um, instead of having two rest days in this type of training program, um, one of your rest days is, is replaced with a cross training day. Okay. So the day after your long run is replaced with a cross training day and rest, um, would be one day a week. Absolutely critical. Okay. Um, intermediate level two. So a little bit more experience wanting to push it a little harder. Um, there is the opportunity to build it out. So you start with it a little bit longer, um, long run on the weekends, and then you incorporate, um, not two, but three total 20 mile runs throughout the course of your training program with in between each 20 mile run, you dip down to 12. Okay. Um, to give yourself a little bit of rest and rehabilitation in between your, your longer weeks of training. Um, again, I don't recommend needing to go higher than 20 if you're a more expert or advanced runner, um, but incorporating a higher number of the 20 mile runs um, can, can um, be a way to kind of break through and continue to make personal bests. Um, okay, let me cover that. Again, so your long run should be slow, 30 to 90 seconds, slower than your marathon pace. Um, there is an opportunity. So if you're feeling really good and you've made it up into your kind of higher volume running weeks, you're not injured, you're feeling fresh at the end of some of your long runs, then you can take this, what's called a three in one training approach. So for the first three quarters of your long run, you run at this nice, easy pace, 30 to 90 seconds, slower than your marathon pace. But if you're still feeling fresh, then you can push it a little bit, slightly faster, but still not up to your race pace. So you still got to hold yourself back, okay? Um, and for those advanced level runners in the crowd, um, they're, you know, the, the key difference in, in um, training for an advanced level runner, um, higher uh, distance long runs, but also adding some of these faster um, speed work um, workouts, okay? Um, so once a week, you want to have regular um, combinations of hill workouts, tempo workouts, and interval training workouts, okay? So for, um, and they, of course, increase in, um, in their distance and number of intervals um, by a, along this sort of gradual ramp up and then into your um, taper before the marathon. So speed training. So what's that all about? So interval training, um, long run repeats, you'll typically do something between 800 meters and 1600 meters with sets between four and eight. Um, there's this uh, popular approach called Yasso repeats, um, which is essentially if you're expecting to run a three hour marathon, you do your 800 repeats in three minutes. So three to three. If you're expecting to run a 345 marathon, you do um, your 800 meter repeats in 345 and so on, okay? So that's a, a good way to approach your, your pace for your 800s. Um, tempo runs, what that is is basically, it's a, a run where you have a continuous acceleration um, with gradual acceleration to your near your 10K pace at the middle component of your run. So for example, for a 30 minute tempo run, you start with 10 minutes easy, then you do 10 or 15 minutes at your 10K piece, pace, and then you'd finish out easy for the, um, the last third of your run. Um, recommend choosing a scenic route if you're doing those because they can be a little painful. And then it's not a bad idea to consider doing solo tempo runs on your own unless you have a training partner who's like really, really your same pace. Um, it's not a bad idea to do them on your own so you're not being pushed too fast or being held back too slow. Um, and then hill repeats can elevate your performance, no pun intended. Um, but essentially it's, it's repeat incline training with brief period of rest. Um, the rest can be either on the descent down the hill, or it can just be a, a little bit of a break at the bottom, depending on the length of the hill and your goals for the day. Um, we touched on that and, um, and we touched on that as well. Okay. So I won't belabor the point. There's lots of details here. These are available on the, the Hal Higdon website, but um, you guys kind of get the general idea. Um, I will note that the um, advanced um, training program, again, incorporates one day a week of rest. 
Um, there's different ways to approach the day after your long training run. And that could be either with a cross training day or with just a very, very short run. Um, either way, you should be uh, doing a, an easy day without a lot of running mileage. Um, this is just a little um, a study that was done from um, the Run Keeper app, but basically um, it showed that runners who ran slower, so they did most of their training at non-Boston qualifying pace, did better at actually Boston qualifying once they got in their marathon. So slower is better, no matter what your um, your uh, level is. Um, it's a, it's still a great way to meet your goals, and you can even if you're training a little bit slower, you can then show up healthy on race day and um, and get the kind of pace times that you need to meet your goals. Okay, so injury prevention, that's what it's all about, the McKaylee Center for Injury Prevention. So um, it's really important here. So like I said, again, so arriving at the start line, healthy is 99% of the battle. Um, you gotta be healthy when you get there um, in order to run your race. So key approaches, so gradually increasing your running volume, um, stick with your training plan, okay? Um, most running injuries are related to doing too much too soon, just ramping up um, before you're ready for it. Um, be wary of um, excess downhill running. Um, it feels easier, but it can kind of burn out your legs and put a, a lot of um, a load through um, the eccentric um, uh, musculature um, as you're running downhill. So just be wary of that. Don't um, overdo your fast runs, adequate rest between workouts, proper nutrition is absolutely key. And Nicole is going to be telling us about that. Proper sleep is also really important. And then avoid over fatigue. Okay. So if you feel really, really worn out after a long weekend of training, then take a day off. Like do not, do not push through being over fatigued. Um, so allow yourself days of rest when you need it. Um, Cardiovascular system seems to adjust a little bit quicker to all this training than the musculoskeletal system. So I think that's part of why we see a lot of injuries crop up around that like 13 to 15 um, um, week mark in your train in training programs, because people's cardiovascular system, their endurance is um, improving in line with their volume of training. Um, but oftentimes the, the musculoskeletal system isn't as ready for it. And so not only are you adding volume, um, you're feeling better, you're running a little faster, um, and that's where injuries can come about. Recommend increasing your total mileage by no more than 10% per week. Get a pair of comfortable running shoes and change it every 300 to 400 miles. Um, of note, that does mean that you will potentially be, you know, during the course of one um, training season for one marathon, you would probably be going through um, two pairs of shoes. So you wouldn't stick in the same shoes throughout your marathon training program. Um, so just be aware of that. Some people will just buy two of the same shoe if they like it. Um, maintaining a healthy body weight um, to optimize your recovery performance and reduce injury risk is absolutely crucial. Um, Nicole is going to touch on the, the nutrition end, but that's absolutely key. Um, and um, it's definitely a time to focus on fueling your body and getting all your, your good calories and nutrition in to uh, reduce risk of injury. Stretching regularly and when in doubt, cross train. Warming up and cooling down is crucial before and after runs with a three to five minute walk, um, sorry, jog or a, a brisk walk. Stretching, you want to stretch um, after a run. You can do some dynamic stretching before a run as well. Um, Sarah will touch on that. And um, you want to stretch to the point of comfortable tension, not pain. You shouldn't be in pain when you're stretching. Um, hold for your stretches for about 20 to 30 seconds. And, um, and then one or two repetitions per muscle group. Um, and then if you feel particularly tight in a specific area, stretch it a little bit more frequently. Even, you know, take a little breaks during your long runs to stretch it out if you need to, okay? Um, warning signs for injury, super important. Okay. So body awareness is just a key part of marathon training and the life of a runner, I think. Um, cause you know, we're, we're all vaguely aware, like marathon running, marathon training should hurt kind of, you know, in some ways, but there are some types of bad pain. So what kind of pain is okay. So general muscle soreness, that's okay. That's something we can tolerate. Um, some slight joint discomfort after a workout or the following day um, that resolves in about 20, less than 24 hours. That's acceptable. You should keep an eye on it, but no, nothing to be too concerned about. Some stiffness, beginning a run that dissipates after, you know, five, 10 minutes. That's um, and also kind of okay pain. Um, keep an eye on it, but, but tolerate that. Um, then there's the red flag pain. 
that says, do not push through this because um, there could be something wrong. So one red flag um, situation would be pain that is present when you start doing a run and then it escalates as you continue on the run. Um, pain that escalates day after day. So, you know, um, you know, Monday, more, Monday run, it was a um, two out of 10 pain. And then it was by Wednesday, it was five out of 10 pain. And now it's, you know, you're on your weekend runs and it's seven, eight out of 10 pain. That's escalating pain day after day. And that would be a, a reason to cause for concern and, and not continue to push through that. Um, pain that alters your stride, makes you compensate in funky ways, um, makes you limp. Um, that is all of concern. No one, you know, no observer should be able to tell that you're hurting um, or that's definitely cause for concern. Um, and the other thing is, you know, if you're experiencing pain in one area, say one area of your foot, and then you're modifying your gait pattern, putting stress on different areas, you're putting other areas of your body at risk for injury. Um, so another reason not to push through that. Pain that wakes you up from night, um, definitely a red flag. Okay. So what do you do if you suspect an injury? Um, icing 15, 20 minutes, two or three times a day, elevating it while you're icing. Rest is crucial. Um, cross train instead of running. Um, especially if you have pain with impact, um, which could indicate a uh, stress injury. Um, you can follow along with uh, doing similar minutes of cross training that you would be doing while running. Okay, so pool running, biking, that kind of thing. You can um, exchange minutes doing those cross training um, for your running time. Um, and then take, a, take some time to just reflect and analyze what could be causing it. So is it mileage increase, pace increases, surface changes, shoes worn out? Um, you know, what, what changed? Um, this is where I think training logs and apps can be pretty handy. Um, so just keeping some kind of, uh, of record of what you've been doing. Not only is it a way to track your kind of personal um, accomplishments in putting all this good training in, but it's also a good way to kind of like trace back um, and do some injury forensics, if you will, to figure out what, what went wrong so you can learn from it in the future. Um, and it can also help with um, diagnosis too. Um, consulting a sports medicine physician is never a bad idea if you have those kinds of red flag pains. I think it's a good idea, honestly, to get it checked out sooner rather than later with everyone putting so much into, um, you know, their, their training and really looking forward to these dates on the calendar um, with, with marathon planning. I think it's not a bad idea to, you know, evaluate it. And um, it's a lot easier to redirect the course of an injury if it's caught sooner rather than later. Um, we're always here um, if there's ever questions um, about any running related injuries. Um, myself and my colleagues in the Injury Runners Clinic would always be happy to answer questions. Um, so what happens if you miss some of your marathon training plan? Um, first of all, don't panic, resist the urge to overcompensate. Um, if you're returning from an injury, spend a, you know, um, if you're cleared for running again, spend a week or two just gradually increasing your training volume. Of course, it's going to depend where you are in your, um, your training ramp up, but um, don't just jump right back in exactly, um, you know, where you would have been had you not been out for an injury. You need to kind of gradually ramp that up, okay? Um, and you can use prior week's training plan as a guide. Be conservative, definitely prioritize healing and recovery first. Write out your kind of return to run plan and stick with it. Um, again, just, uh, having a calculated plan can, can go a long way. Um, COVID safety wouldn't be, um, it wouldn't be this year if we didn't talk a little bit about COVID safety, but um, maintaining social distancing guidelines, always important, you know, wearing a mask, everyone will have a mask plan, particularly in crowded areas. Running groups, you know, um, hopefully we can get back to those, you know, someday when it's safe, but right now, um, better to avoid those if we can. High touch surfaces like traffic buttons. Um, uh, don't go to touching these if you don't have to. Spitting is not not great these days. Um, and then, you know, of course, washing your hands when you get home and all that good stuff. Okay, so that is kind of my take on things. I'm excited to hear from um, Nicole and Sarah. Happy to take any questions um, if anyone has any questions about all that. Kristen, do you want to read the questions yeah. or do you want me to read it? Yeah, them? absolutely. Okay. okay. So Kathy Rice, great. Okay. Um, has there been any long-term studies on the impact of long distance running? 
and um, on your joints and your heart. Seems most of the older runners I know are no longer able to run due to knee or joint issues. Also, what about the impact on heart, specifically scar tissue? Um, gotcha. Um, okay. Yeah. So, um, so you know, I think for um, for anybody, there are certain trade-offs with um, you know distance running and um, risks in terms of cardiovascular health, as well as um, you know, risk for injury or um, related to the musculoskeletal system. There are certainly benefits in terms of um, uh, general health from any type of regular cardiovascular activity and weight control. So um, there's definitely benefits in terms of um, general cardiovascular health, decreasing risk for cardiac events, um, by maintaining a, a regular cardiovascular exercise regimen. Um, depending on one's specific um, training patterns, um, biomechanics, sometimes there is, you know, there's theoretical risk for, um, you know, wear on, on joints um, in some ways, but I think it does depend on the certain person's um, running biomechanics patterns. I think like anything in life, there is a, a trade-off. So there's risks and benefits that can be weighed for each individual. Um, but there's such a benefit for joint health in terms of maintaining healthy weight over time um, that there are, you know, I think that there's, there's somewhat of a, a trade-off. So you get the benefit of maintaining healthy weight, decreasing risk for obesity, which can itself be um, unhealthy for joints. Um, but you do have put yourself at risk for some overuse injuries along the way um, with certain training patterns, particularly if you aren't careful with running gait biomechanics. Um, there was Lisa Clark said there's a cat on the keyboard. That's okay. That's part of um, that's just part of webinars these days. So um, you have to thank your cat for listening. Um, and then there was a question: Why only resting one day versus two for more advanced runners? I think that's a good question. Um, the so um, thanks for asking that, Kyle. So the for for more advanced runners, um, you know maintaining one day of rest per week is definitely going to be really important. Um, for folks who have a lot of experience with running marathons, there is some studies that, um, that link the total amount of mileage per week with um, better uh, race times. So um, once you're at a, a more advanced level and, um, and can withstand more mileage per week, um, it's actually a pretty strong correlation that you're, you're finish times come out faster. Um, so I think that is part of why um, the more advanced crowd might opt for only one rest day per week while um, maintaining just one um, day per week that's either a really short run or a cross training um, day. But um, Kyle, I agree with your question and that there can be some concern you want to keep an eye on that in terms of risk for injury and not overdo it. But um, I think the, the general thought is that more mileage is faster once you get to a, uh, a certain level of um, experience. Peace and love principle. Thoughts on this new acronym that works. Um, that's an interesting one. So I'm not sure about that. I'll have to look that up and get back to you. Um, any thoughts about training for the new majors calendar? Boston is four weeks from New York. What do you recommend between races? Um, so I think that's a really good question. Um, so um, so for in terms of the new majors calendar, um, four weeks between these races, um, I would recommend brief period of rest for at least um, seven to 10 days and um, light cardiovascular exercise, um, focus on muscle um, joint recovery for at least seven to 10 days before then um, a gradual ramp up prior to the, the um, next marathon four weeks later. Do the training principles um, change at all for trail running versus street running? Um, they do a bit. Um, I would, for trail running, my general thought is because the terrain can be so variable and, um, you know, inclines, elevations can be a major factor in trail running. Um, I would also almost recommend um, the marathon training can be done almost on more of a time-based um, approach. So 
a lot of trail runners, if they're spending most of their training program on trails, especially if there's a lot of elevation, they might prefer doing a time-based training regimen. Um, and I'm happy to kind of provide some of those training regimens if there is um, interest in that. Um, you can just shoot me an email. Um, when you say Christy, can you just back up um, to Anne? To what? Um, go up a few com a few questions to Anne. Yeah. How would you adjust the plan yeah. for someone who's been running for 40 years and thus has great aerobic base but is moving up to the marathon for the first time? Um, good question. I would say, um, so if you, you're a really experienced runner, um, but you're doing your marathon for the first time, I would recommend that presumably you've probably done things like 5k, 10k races in the past. You might have, um, enough data or experience on some of your shorter distance run times to be able to extrapolate um, what your marathon pace might be. There's calculators online that you can um, that you can find where if you know your 10K pay, pace, your 5K pace, you can extrapolate what your marathon goal would be. And you could potentially incorporate that um, expected marathon pace into your Wednesday runs. So that midweek run where um, oftentimes a, a true beginner marathon runner might just be running slow, running easy. You might try running those Wednesday runs at your goal marathon race pace. Um, that's my kind of initial thought. But I think, you know, you, you probably have experience with um, enough shorter races to um, step up your, your pacing a little bit more and in, in measured doses through some of those um, sort of long Wednesday runs. Okay, and um, when do you suggest a beginner runner signs up for a marathon? Should one, wait, should one wait until completing some of the training in order to better gauge the schedule? In other words, should one plan for unexpected injury fatigue when building a training schedule with a marathon date in mind? Um, you know what, I think um, so many of the marathon um, registrations are so far in advance um, that you oftentimes have many, many calendar months to, to, to re you know, register ahead of time and, and mark it. Um, I would, you know, if you are definitely a beginner, um, I would kind of incorporate some of that, um, like I mentioned that base program in before your 18 weeks which will allow you to your point, a little bit more time to, um, you know, respond in case of any unexpected, expected air fatigue, actually just really kind of like prepare your building blocks and your base. Um, check out the base program from um, Hal Higdon's website, but I would, I would sign up, you know, with the rest of the crowd on the deadline, probably, you know, many calendar months in advance, and then just take a look at a good base program that will give you the kind of comfort and foundation you need to advance into um, the, the ramp up um, marathon training program. Thanks everyone for your questions. All right. Thank you so much, Kristen. This is wonderful. I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and share my video now. <laughs> so I'm, I'm so excited to be here today. And let me just share my screen All right here. All right, if I could get a, uh, maybe a thumbs up or hand raise, um, just make sure. All right, thank you, thank you. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you all so much and good morning. I am, I'm Nicole Farnsworth. I am one of the sports dietitians at Boston Children's Hospital and I am thrilled to be here with you today to talk about performance nutrition for runners with special consideration for the marathon. Um, I am a runner myself as well, though not as experienced as Dr. Whitney. So Kristen, I'm definitely going to have to get some tips from you when getting back into marathon training. I have one under my belt, um, but loved it so much. This former track athlete is, I think, have a, has a few more to try. <laughs> so as a dietitian, I am here to talk to you about nutrition. And 
you know, that is such an important feature of the marathon. Um, you're putting in as, as uh, you know, Dr. Whitney told you, you're putting in a lot of work into your training, um, a lot of miles, very consistently, week after week in preparation to hit that starting line. You know, that 99% of the work is getting there and staying healthy. The nutrition is going to be a similar approach. Nutrition is going to keep help sustain that health and all of the work that you're putting in, you know, from, you know, miles on, on the roads or treadmills to strength training. And it's also going to be preparation for fueling during the marathon. So what we'll talk about today is that your nutrition while you're running does matter and it can make a difference. So we're going to start by going, you know, to nutrition school 101. We're going to talk about the three macronutrients. I'm sure many of you are familiar with them, but I'll be going through why they're important, what they do. And we're going to look at that comprehensively on a plate as well. We're going to talk about timing. So what to eat and when to provide fuel before training runs, during training runs and after, as well as some special considerations for the big race day. We'll talk about hydration. Um, a little bit of uh, highlight on some micronutrients, not all, that are important considerations for runners. Uh, a discussion around energy and why that's important, why it's important to eat enough food when training. Um, a little bit of a highlight on, you know, being in the middle of the pandemic, how to run safely and fuel during that time. And then when to see a sports dietitian if you feel after this presentation that you have more questions or you want to dive more, um, more personalized approach. Okay, so our first real foray into nutrition, we're going to talk about those macronutrients. And if you didn't know them before, you're going to know them now. Those are carbohydrates, protein, and fat. So we're going to start with my personal favorite, which are carbohydrates. These are your source of energy. They're the body's optimal and first choice for fuel. And as a runner, you're using your aerobic system very, very readily. And you probably can tell that for the runners on this webinar by your heavy breathing um, during your runs or even slightly labored breathing. Moderate to heavy intensity running will be using carbohydrate. When we think about carbohydrates, I love to use analogies and I like to have you know, all of you think of your body as a car and then carbohydrate or broken down carbohydrate, which is glucose as your gasoline. So similarly to the more you're driving your car, the more you're stopping for gas, the more you're stopping at rest stops to fill your tank. I want you to think of the same thing with carbohydrates and your body. The more you're training, the more you're moving your body, you want to think about coming back and getting in more carbohydrates. Now we'll talk about how, what that actually means, how that looks on your plate on a later slide, but that's just something to think about if you're kind of looking to your day-to-day -day activity as well. Carbohydrates also have a protein sparing effect. What that means is that when we get in enough carbohydrate, we're using that for energy. Because as I said, that's your primary source of fuel. That's what your body wants to use. It's quick to use. It's perfect. Um, when we're not getting in enough carbohydrates, the body is very smart. It knows it needs the energy. So what it does is it actually takes from muscle protein and reconverts and uses protein for energy. Now, this is not very efficient or effective, and it can compromise strength training, all that work that you're putting in to have that muscle development for, for your running, for um, all of that effort. Um, and I'm sure that strength training pieces, again, we're going we're gonna to touch on that with Sarah a little later. Um, so we want to get in enough carbohydrate because you want that protein to stay in the muscle. So we say carbohydrates have that sparing effect for that reason. And when we're thinking about carbohydrates, I want to make sure to emphasize that there are no good and bad carbohydrates. I know this messaging can sometimes come around, um, especially, you know, on the internet with social media. Instead, I want you to think about carbohydrates as slow digesting and fast digesting. So our slow digesting carbohydrates are what you might think of when you're looking at complex carbohydrates. So they have protein and fiber. They can include brown rice, beans, and other legumes. Um, they can include, uh, you know, whole wheat pastas and grains. These are going to have a very stabilizing effect on your blood sugar. And the general recommendation from the USDA is trying to make 50% of your carbohydrate intake these complex carbohydrates or slow digesting carbs. They're great to have at meals um, or other parts of the day if you would like to, but you certainly don't have to eat 
all slow digesting carbohydrates. You can have the fast ones as well, which is what we'll come to next. So on the flip side, fast digesting carbohydrates, these do not contain much fiber at all or protein. And so what they actually do is they spike blood sugar levels up. And while in certain, you know, that may be thought of as a bad thing, it actually can be really useful, especially before and during activity, which we'll come to when we're talking about nutrient timing. And again, the guidelines say you only have to make 50% of your grains whole. So for example, if you prefer your sushi with white rice, there's nothing wrong with that. You shouldn't feel like you have to have brown rice or opt for a whole grain, slow digesting carbohydrate at your meals. But you can think of it as a balance and you can kind of pick and choose your forms. And we'll, again, come back to fast digesting when it comes to fueling later. Now, our next macronutrient is protein. Protein, we often think of it with every athlete that I talk to for its role in muscle development, um, muscle building and strength. Uh, and athletes do need more protein than non-athletes. So this is true to maintain lean body mass. But protein also does so much more in the body. It is a part of every body cell. It is a building block and involved in all reactions in the body. So it really has so many roles. And in addition to that, it provides fullness and satiety at our meals. So if you've ever had a meal which has been devoid of protein, maybe it was a salad and you forgot to add a chicken or steak or beans to it, you may have noticed you were pretty hungry soon afterward. And that's really speaking to the fullness and satiety role of protein. We really emphasize getting a nice variety of protein um, in for you know, the various benefits of the different amino acids that build protein. So, and even for plant-based um, or non-plant-based, that variety is great and so helpful and useful. Um, this is really the last option for fuel. So that's kind of speaking to that protein sparing effect that I was mentioning on the previous slide. And I did kind of touch on this, but if there are any plant-based runners, you just want to make sure to get variety of protein and you want to really, you know, touch base on the nutrients that might be in protein, um, animal containing protein sources that aren't in plant containing ones, such as vitamin B12. Um, but protein is very important. So you want to make sure to be getting that in very regularly throughout your day. And then our last macronutrient is fat. This is a very important energy source, a very nutrient dense energy source. Uh, we want to be you, getting this in at all of our meals. It helps sustain low intensity exercise, but it also provides that fullness and satiety, similar to protein. It's important for hormone function and immune health, and it enhances nutrient absorption. So what that means is that we are able to more better absorb nutrients from our meals when we incorporate a fat source, especially the fat soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K. Now we'll talk about vitamin D specifically because of its role in bone health on a later slide. But essentially that means like if you're having a sandwich or a salad, you know, making sure to add cheese or avocado, salad dressing, making sure to have that fat in that meal, in every meal can really help with that nutrient absorption, improving nutrient status, and then supporting all the other roles that fat plays in our diet. Okay, so I kind of mentioned that everything would come together. And this is probably one of my most utilized slides that I use as a sports dietitian. So these are the athlete's plates. Um, for those who might be familiar with the USDA My Plate, these are essentially a taking off from that model and applying to the active individual. Uh, so as you can see, you can look at the left-hand side and see that there's that easy training weight management plate. And that'll see the, you know, the half the plate of fruits and vegetables, quarter plate whole grains, quarter plate lean protein. And as you're going across the plates here, you'll notice that those grains become a bigger portion of that plate, which makes sense when we're coming back and thinking about what the role of carbohydrates are in the body. They're important for energy. So if you're training longer, if you're training more intensely, you're going to need more carbohydrates. So thinking back to Dr. Whitney's wonderful breakdown of the training plans, as your mileage increases, 
you will probably, you'll naturally maybe even want to, but you definitely want to intentionally gravitate to have more carbohydrate on your plate since your body is utilizing more energy. Conversely, during times of injury, you may find that your carbohydrates come down, but a big thing I like to highlight is no matter what your level of activity, and even in times of no activity, none of the food groups ever go away. We don't recommend eliminating any food group for any reason or any food for any reason, unless there's some sort of food allergy or intolerance. Um, but these, um, you can see that beyond the grains moving, the protein stays pretty consistent. The fruits and vegetables make space on the plate for the increased carbohydrates, since that's so critical for fueling. And one missing piece is that you might not notice there's no fat groups on the plate, which I like to usually insert in, and I didn't on this slide, but please make sure, as I said before, to include at least one source of fat in your meals at every meal. So that's a critical piece that I like to add. Um, this is also meant to be a starting point. So if you end up eating your athlete's plate and you're still hungry, like by all means, you can go back for more, but this is going to at least help with a sense of when we move our bodies more, we take in more carbohydrates and that's really critical. Okay. So now that we have, you know, really gotten into the nutrition here, we got a sense of the different macronutrients, those big three. Let's talk now about nutrient timing, what to eat when in order to fuel and feel your best during training and during your race as well. So this, um, this image is really meant to capture pre-activity nutrient timing. So this um, individual in the starting position is signifying the start of exercise. This could be the start of training, the start of your race. Um, and you can see the further out that you go from that starting point, there is a larger part of that triangle and it contains carbohydrates, protein, and fat. Now this will be a uh, signifying a meal or that athlete's plate in a way. Um, you really want to be looking towards that nice balance and getting in that adequacy there since you're going to have three to four hours to digest before exercise. As you're getting closer to exercise time, you'll notice that triangle narrows down and it really comes down to carbohydrates. And this is again, because of the role of carbohydrate in fueling. Um, we don't want to have too much protein, fat, or fiber within that hour of activity, because what it can do is it can really sit in the stomach, slow digestion, and that can feel quite uncomfortable. This might be unique person to person, and I'll touch on that a little later. Um, but in general, carbohydrates and those fast carbohydrates are really helpful before activity. So that's something to um, keep in mind um, when you're looking at nutrient timing. Now on the flip side with recovery nutrition, we want to look towards supporting all of the work that you're putting in, logging those miles and developing that strength by really capitalizing on that and recovering well. Once you finish activity, your body is immediately in repair mode. It is trying to replenish that lost carbohydrate that you use for energy, which is glycogen when it's in its storage form. It's trying to replenish glycogen and rebuild it. It's trying to repair muscle. And that 45 minutes after activity is what's called our recovery window. And that's when the body is repairing most uh, rapidly. So if we take in nutrition during that window, we're actually helping to speed up our recovery process and really optimize that. And that can be really important when you're training day in and day out for weeks and weeks on end in preparation for a race. We recommend carbohydrates and a little bit of protein to optimize recovery. A lot of examples, and you may have, if you've, um, you know, met with a dietitian or you're familiar with the gut milk campaigns, um, have seen chocolate milk as being like the gold standard of recovery. And there is a lot of truth to that. The chocolate being added into the milk actually brings up the carbohydrate content, which is so helpful for recovery. And a lot of recovery nutrition will actually contain dairy product in some way, because there's a elevated amount of the amino acid leucine, which is shown to be very helpful in that recovery process as well. Um, it doesn't have to be in there, but you may notice that dairy is very commonly in recovery nutrition products or in recommendations that at least that I make. <laughs> you want to also follow up on that recovery snack or meal with a meal a few hours, one to two hours later. That is a nice balanced athlete's plate again. So it does not have to be chicken and vegetables and a potato, 
But you really just, again, want to come back to that athlete's plate and get balanced because recovery is not just what you eat right after you're running. It is what you choose to eat for the rest of that day. That's also supporting your recovery. So what about the during, right? Um, so with marathon fueling and fueling for endurance exercise lasting longer than an hour in general, the thought is that carbohydrates being our main source of fuel, you want to get around 30 to 60 grams per hour after that first hour for sustained energy. So this will be unique person to person, whether 30 to 60 grams is tolerated. Um, so this is something that you'd want to experiment with and you can use your form of carbohydrates that you'd like. There are many products out there. I'm sure many of you are familiar with goo packets or uh, sport beans or even honey sticks. Um, you want to go for the fast carbohydrates because they're going to bring that blood sugar level up. Um, and it might be some experimentation. That's where that third bullet point comes in. So beyond carbohydrate intake, you also want to practice regular hydration and electrolyte replenishment. We'll talk about hydration um, in particular later, but main, having that you know, regular hydration will help with uh, heat regulation. It'll help with that endurance performance and cardiorespiratory regulation. And you're using losing electrolytes through sweat. So you do want to replenish those with um, some sort of, you know, modality, whether it be through something like a food product or through a sport drink. The big thing with marathon fueling is practice, practice, practice. So utilizing those long runs, for example, as an opportunity to try out different sources of fuel, different ways of eating it, different timing. Um, that will be so helpful to see how your digestive system responds, especially if you're a beginner, your body might not be used to eating and running at the same time or drinking fluid and running at the same time. So you really want to practice this to get used to it. This could be, and again, um, a place where walking becomes really helpful too, as Dr. Whitney mentioned. So if you're, you know, needing to walk and fuel, that's okay. Um, we want to make sure you're getting the nutrition in because the last thing we want to do, especially in a marathon or in the training portion is run into a depletion of glucose. If anyone's had that happen before and really hit that wall, you know, that it is so difficult to move forward from that because once that gas tank is empty, it is, it is hard to keep going forward. Now, I also want to touch on carbohydrate loading. So I imagine many of you have heard about carb loading. The thought behind it and the science behind it is we have that storage carbohydrate known as glycogen. And the science is if we could maximize that storage, really push the limits of how much is stored, we will have more energy to pull from when it comes to the actual endurance event. And it is true that when we carbo load for events longer than 90 minutes, we can actually sustain performance and improve outcomes and have the ability to go further. Um, like I said, this is shown to be effective in events longer than 90 minutes. Uh, and the idea is that in the few days leading up to the marathon, you'd want to have that that taper and resting period for the body. And then you'd want to increase carbohydrate. Now, if you think about it with the athlete's plate, what happens is that you're taking up space away from other foods for more carbohydrate. And that's what you're doing. Essentially, you're not trying to eat more carbohydrate on top of more vegetables and protein, you're actually going to replace some of those calories with more carbohydrate based nutrition in those days leading up. And if you want to go into specifics for yourself, um, we can certainly do that probably more in a personalized setting because there are some calculations involved, but there is science to back up carbo loading for longer endurance events. Absolutely. So I'm hoping this could be a nice reference for strong snacking, um, both pre-workout and post-workout, and maybe also some inspiration for snacking during the day too, because as, a, as someone who's training for a race, you're going to be wanting to fuel every few hours. And um, we don't want to go long stretches of time. That's important for energy availability. So pre-workout, mainly carbohydrates, as we talked about, granola bars are great, yogurt and fruit. Um, you may notice that I put peanut butter in here um, and you might be thinking, okay, like that has protein and fat in it. I thought we said only carbohydrates. This is where it's important to, you know, think about like everyone's a little unique and is going to have the different ability to digest different foods. So I, for example, can have a peanut butter on a bagel 
before my long run, pretty close to it, I'll feel okay. Like I won't have much issue with it. But I have friends who would never dream of that because peanut butter does not sit well. They would much prefer to go with jelly or something with way more simple carbohydrate. It's important to know the difference. This is where practice really comes to play. So everyone's different. If you can tolerate peanut butter, by all means, include it. If you find that you're better off doing something like a jelly or using another example from here, I think that's totally great. So carbohydrates are the key part for before and during. And then again, afterward, carbohydrates and protein, chocolate milk, a smoothie, yogurt and granola, even a sandwich or a complete meal. So I forgot to mention this too. If you're going straight from running to a meal within that 45 minute window, that can count as your recovery as well. And again, practice, practice, practice. Experiment with different foods, combinations of foods and timing so that when you are at your race day, you have your plan in your mind, you know what works. And this goes for before the race as well as during. Okay, so hydration. This is a really important one, um, especially if you're thinking about any of the marathons, but a race like Boston can be highly variable from the weather perspective when it's in April. I'm really curious to see in the fall setting what it's like, but with hydration, it's really, really critical for the ability to regulate body temperature to, um, you know, we want to minimize fluid loss. Um, we really want to stay hydrated as possible during training and competition. So how do we do that? Um, a big thing is staying on top of your thirst. Um, so often we get that thirst cue and it's important to listen to it, hydrate regularly throughout the day and go into training as regularly hydrated or you hydrated as possible. Um, carrying a reusable water bottle can help. I understand with being in COVID, wearing masks certainly makes it difficult if you're in a workplace and you can't necessarily remove your mask. So doing the best you can with that. And then once you're in your training, trying to drink every 10 to 30 minutes during training, um, taking sips of water here and there. And if you wanted to get really specific, there are ways to create individualized plans for hydration based on your age, um, the sweat, your personal sweat level, if you're a heavy or salty sweater versus not, um, and intensity. And it can get further specific based on, you know, how humid you think the day is going to be, if it's going to be a warmer day or a colder one. Something I like to highlight, especially because we are still kind of in this New England back and forth weather, is just because the weather is cold right now doesn't mean you aren't losing fluid. And actually prolonged activity in cold weather leads to similar sweat rates as warm weather. So even in the winter, you want to be very cognizant of fluid needs and hydration. And then after activity, you want to come back and continue that hydration process to make up for fluid lost um, that wasn't able to be replenished on your actual runs. Now, sports drinks are very useful um, and can be utilized during running and during marathon training. They have the benefit of replacing electrolytes that are lost in the sweat, so that's sodium, chloride, and potassium. And they also help provide those carbohydrates to maintain energy. They're formulated to be really well tolerated in the stomach and to provide you with both of those things, which are critical during activity. So if you do are doing a longer training session, I do think sports drinks can be really helpful. They can also be useful if you notice you have a nervous stomach or sensitive stomach right before activity and you can't get in a snack, an actual food snack. A liquid carbohydrate containing beverage like a sports drink could help give you that little extra carb before you hit the road. Now, how do we know about, you know, how our hydration is? Um, one easy way to do a little double check is by looking at the color of your urine. So this is a P chart. Um, so we want to focus in on the further left side here that is symbolized by the hydrated. So like a light yellow color, similar to a lemonade, that is signaling to the body that we are doing pretty well on the hydration front. In, you might notice that you're, you know, veering toward the right side, especially maybe first thing in the morning. And that's okay if it's first thing in the morning. But if you do notice your urine is darker, trying to get in a little more fluid. I like to also add that we don't want urine to be clear. Um, there is such a thing as overhydration, and that can be very dangerous. And especially when we're really overhydrated, it can be um, a medical emergency. So we really don't want to overhydrate. Um, and so 
trying to aim for that light yellow can be a good kind of goal point to work towards. Okay, now we're going to highlight just a few vitamins and minerals. I just wanna highlight three that come up a lot when I'm meeting with runners, um, things that can be really important to consider for bone health and for oxygen usage. Um, so we'll, we'll jump into this before, before continuing on. The first um, vitamin I want to talk about is vitamin D. So as I mentioned earlier, vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin. It helps optimize our calcium absorption, and it is a support for bone building. It's synthesized by the body via sunlight exposure. So when we are exposed to UV rays, our body actually creates this cascade of events that leads to vitamin D creation in the body for usage. We also can get it from some foods, some mushrooms, fatty fish, um, but sunlight exposure is a huge source. And being in New England, we don't get sunlight exposure as dependably, especially during the winter months. So this is something that your physician might monitor to ensure that you have adequate vitamin D consumption. Um, and if it's found that your vitamin D levels are low, it might be you know, recommended to, to supplement, which is a totally okay. Um, I forgot to mention another great source of, of dietary vitamin D are fortified foods like orange juice, but especially milk. Um, and again, the fat content in milk will help with absorption. Our other um, mineral now that I want to talk about in relative to bone building is calcium. So calcium helps with bone mineral density development. Uh, bone mineral density is that strength or thickness of bone. Um, it helps decrease stress fracture risk, improve bone healing following bone injury, and aids in muscle contraction. And again, as I mentioned, vitamin D actually helps with the absorption of calcium. It's like the little buddy system there. So you want to be getting both of those for sure. There are very dietary sources. Um, dairy is certainly one of the most talked about ones, but also broccoli, tofu, almond, and fortified foods, um, including that orange juice. So a big recommendation for those who do not have a dairy allergy um, is trying to get in three servings of dairy per day spread out throughout the day is a great way to ensure you're meeting your calcium needs. Um, and this could be milk, yogurt, or cheese, or ice cream. Um, and the reason I say spread throughout the day is that your body only absorbs 500 milligrams at maximum of calcium in one sitting. So you want to be optimizing absorption by spreading them out. Um, you can certainly have some together, but by having them in a few occasions throughout the day, you're increasing the likelihood that you'll hit the recommended dietary intake. Okay. Our last micronutrient that I want to talk about is another mineral, it's iron. And iron is one that comes up a lot with runners. It's important because it is part of hemoglobin and helps transport oxygen from the lungs to the muscles. And this is one that comes up with runners when they experience maybe heavy legs or significant fatigue. At that point, we're starting to think about if we should evaluate and look at iron status. There is an increased risk of deficiency of iron in runners, females, endurance distances and vegans and vegetarians. And sometimes runners can be multiple of these. Um, and so that isn't to say that this is a guarantee that someone would get an iron deficiency. But if you suspect there's an iron deficiency, my big recommendation is meet with your physician and look at labs. We will not, we do not recommend blindly supplementing. We want to really have a confirmation of deficiency in order to come back and provide supplementation if it's needed. Um, there's also other reasons athletes can experience fatigue, which is why we don't want to just supplement blindly. The dietary sources include animal and plant or heme and non-heme sources. As you can see, animal sources have a higher absorption rate than plant sources, but you can optimize absorption of those non-heme sources by doing things such as using a cast iron skillet, um, or pairing one of those veggie sources with vitamin C. And um, that in increases its absorption factor. Okay, so the next topic I wanna jump into is energy availability. And this is a, when we're thinking about the energy that our body has to use for all other functions beyond exercise. So if you take the calories you intake during the day and subtract the calories from training, what's left over is energy availability. And again, this is everything else your body needs for energy. Um, 
And that's the most simple form of the equation. When we have enough in that piece of the equation, all is well. But if we run too low in that because we're either training so much that the nutrition can't keep up or the nutrition's dropped while the training has stayed elevated, you can run into low energy availability. And the analogy I like to use, um, since I do love analogies, is your smartphone being in low power mode. So when your smartphone is in low power mode, it is conserving energy. Maybe it's doing that by reducing the screen brightness, pausing background activity, slowing the performance speed of your phone. And it may actually disable the use of certain power hungry apps. Now your body is very smart and it has to do something similar in order to make sure that you are able to do the things you need to do. And so what can happen is that you can fall into that low energy availability when you're not getting in enough to support the training you're doing. These are just some signs and symptoms of low EA so that if these look familiar to you during your training process, it could be worth meeting with a physician or with a dietitian to get an evaluation and check in and make sure that your energy availability is optimal and supporting all the work you're putting in. So excessive fatigue, um, vitamin deficiencies and an iron deficiency, muscle loss, recurrent injury or illness can be a piece of this menstrual dysfunction or other hormone irregularities. So um, for those who are familiar with the female athlete triad, this is often where we see a lack of menstrual periods for females, which is abnormal and we don't want to be seeing that irregularity. Um, but men are not free of this as well. We often see low testosterone as well when we're not getting in enough nutrition. Other signs and symptoms are stress fractures, trouble with recovery or performance gains, irritability, difficulty with sleep and poor concentration. And while these are the signs and symptoms, um, this is the model that we use to describe what happens during low energy availability. So this is relative energy deficiency in sport or REDS. And this has become a very popular point of discussion among the professional running world recently, as many athletes have been vocal about their experience with REDS. Um, one such example is the um, op-ed published in the Times by Mary Kane in November 2019. So she expressed her experience with not getting inadequate nutrition. She was suffering from a number of bone injuries, lack of menstrual period. Um, but this model actually describes so much more that can be affected both from a health perspective and subsequently from performance as well. And again, rather than just females being affected, males can be affected by inadequate nutrition as well. So if you notice or suspect any of these symptoms, then it can be a good idea to meet with a dietitian to take a look at your nutrition and ensure that you're getting in that optimal energy availability and really, you know, making the best use of all that work that you're putting in day in and day out with training and preparation for your marathon. So last thing I want to touch on here before I wrap up is thinking about nutrition in the time of COVID, because I have met with many an athlete um, from all sports and it can be very difficult to try to keep on top of eating and drinking and all of the fueling needs while wearing a mask most of the day. Um, so my big things are working on fueling and hydrating when you can. So if you know that you have to wear a mask for a few hours, maybe that means your meal before then is going to be slightly larger to carry you through. Um, maybe you're going to be drinking more water when you can in the comfort of home or using somehow a, a finding a space at work or at school where you can take in water, maybe even pull your mask down a little bit if you're not allowed, if you're allowed to. Um, the other thing can be if you're working from home is trying to create that structure to ensure that you remind yourself to go to the kitchen and grab lunch or go grab a snack, fill a water bottle and keep it at your desk to help ensure that you're able to fuel and hydrate during your day. And then during training, Look to sources that may be easy to consume under your mask if you need to. So if you're able to pull your mask up to take a sip of a water bottle that has a narrowed lid, or if you need to use a goo packet or something that you can slide under your mask or move your mask briefly to, to uh, consume something. So th this will be another layer of practice and experimentation, but things to keep in mind, because even though we, we absolutely want to be practicing safe measures, um, we want to be following CDC recommendations, we also don't want to neglect the nutrition at the same time. So when could it be a good idea to meet with a sports dietitian? Um, 
I would say anytime. You're welcome to meet with me or my colleague, uh, Laura Moretti Reese, whenever. Um, but you could be helpful to meet with sports dietitian if you do have specific questions related to fueling and nutrition timing for training or races. If you're looking to dive in deeper on hydration and get a sense of planning, um, if you have any gastrointestinal concerns, and if it's related to the sport and we can make adjustments to your nutrition timing to help, we certainly will. And then if we feel in our professional opinion that it requires a consult with a specialist, we'll make that recommendation. Um, we also, sports dietitians can help with nutrition following injury or how to, you know, help support repair and getting back into running if you're injured and any suspected or confirmed low energy availability. So we're really here to help with, with any of your fueling or hydration needs. And I just want to do a quick plug for the female athlete conference. Um, I am a member of the planning committee, so I'm very excited about it. We're fully virtual this year. Um, so for those who are female athletes or work with female athletes from a coaching or training or, you know, sports medicine perspective, this is two and a half days dedicated to all of that. And so if you're interested, there is a, um, here is a save the date for you. And our registration is now open. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. I'll go ahead and I'll take a look here at the questions. If you scroll up a little bit to around 8.50, the first question for nutrition is from Erica. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So nutrition question, I am a long distance runner and I follow a paleo diet. Uh, so always such a push to carb load. Any guidance with respect to nutrition for the paleo runner? So this is a challenging one, um, certainly because your sources of carbohydrates may be a little limited, but I would try to work within, if you are committed to following paleo, trying to work within the confines of that if you can, if you're willing to have some flexibility and maybe make exceptions around training, it could be worth experimenting with that um, if you feel open to it, um, given the importance of the carbohydrates there. Um, but yes, it can be a push and a challenge to carbo load. And maybe it's just situational for in that carbo loading period, as opposed to during your training. Um, definitely. So it's a great question. Oh yes. I'm familiar with, um, Morton. Great. What are your thoughts about fat loading followed by carb loading as recommended by Matt Fitzgerald? Um, 10 days of fat loading followed by three days of carb loading prior to a marathon race day. So this is certainly um, a point of research and discussion. And there is kind of some conversation even about training low and racing high when it comes to carbohydrate. And this kind of like follows that, that uh, um, supports that kind of that cascade of, of doing carbo loading. Um, as of my knowledge at this point, that it's pretty comparable to traditional carbohydrate loading. So I think it's a matter, uh, it seems like it's more of a matter of preference, but I'd be happy to look more into um, the fat loading research and, and get back to you. All right, can I rely on gels only during a marathon with water or I need to mix in um, and electrolytes since gels don't have electrolytes? So this is something of a debate too, and I should have mentioned this, is that you do want to get the electrolytes in and you do want to get the carbohydrates in, but you want to be very cognizant of where that's coming from. Because if you're drinking Gatorade and getting in goose, you might be potentially unintentionally overloading your stomach with carbs beyond what you can handle, which can lead to some GI distress. So you can, there are sources of electrolytes that do not have carbohydrate in them. One that immediately comes to mind are noon tablets. So it is possible that you could get in the electrolytes and do gels separately. Some gels also do have electrolyte in them. So if you check the label, you might find ones that contain both. Um, sport beans, I know do. So I met, and I imagine many of the, some of the goos do as well. Another thing to look towards is, uh, as Dr. Whitney mentioned, like, a lot of the race information is present and up on the website long before the race actually starts. And there are often sponsored fueling um, companies that run the training tables. 
So there'll be hydration stations regularly throughout the marathon. There will also at some stations potentially be fuel offered to you as well. So it could be worthwhile to take a look at that, see what they're offering. And if you want to, rather than carrying all of your fuel, if you want to take in theirs, it could be worth considering practicing with the same products that they're using on the race day. So that again, practice, 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 practice. There's nothing new on race day. It's a big adage in sports nutrition. Um, so it could be worth looking into that, but yes, you could rely on gels. You could look to see if there's gels with electrolytes, or you could also take in some sort of electrolyte source to help with fluid replenishment. Do you have any tips for the runner who has thalassemia, levels of hemoglobin, um, but can't supplement with iron since your body's unable to process it? Absolutely. So I think that this one, um, I'd have to look more at the thalassemia research and see what we're currently recommending for our runners. And um, it's possible that Dr. Whitney, you may, you if you know um, current recommendations, feel, please feel free to chime in on this. Um, but I would need to, to check in on it um, for sure. We don't necessarily, as you said, don't want to supplement with iron, um, but you can think of other ways to help support that oxygen carrying capacity. I think it's a good question. I would talk with your hematologist, to be honest. Um, I know from a nutrition standpoint for um, supporting for general health for folks with thalassemia, it's um, a diet, you know, high in fruits and vegetables. Um, so that would be a greater part of your athlete's plate um, and avoidance in, in some of the foods that are higher in iron. But I would consult with your hematologist if you're thinking about getting into marathon running, because I think it's worth the question. Um, and it's a great question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> um, another one is the appropriate amount of water to drink per day, putting sport aside. So this one's um, a great question. So if you take your body weight in pounds and divide it by two, that's the number of ounces you want to aim for in a day. So for like a 150 pound individual, 75 ounces is that baseline that you'd want to work towards. And that's the way you can use it. It's using your own body weight as a gauge. Um, and then from there, you can make adjustments based on activity level. So that's an easy way to get that baseline amount of hydration. Um, I often run early in the morning and do not have an appetite. If the runs are shorter, is it okay to wait and to eat after? So my general recommendation with that is if your activity is in like the 30-ish minute range, maybe 40 minutes, you don't have to eat first thing if you're not hungry, but if your run is going to be a little longer than that, you're going to run into that depleted glycogen storage. And so then you're going to start to feel the effects of that. So it could, and so I would say you could run fasted in a shorter run situation, but if you're hungry or your run's going to be longer, trying to get something in, even if it's having a goo or, um, you know, uh, something simple in the morning as a light snack before going on your run could be beneficial to make sure we're getting in that glycogen. And yes, if you are hungry for those who are, who, you know, maybe do wake up with a little more of an appetite, um, trying to get in something in the morning can be really beneficial. And I do recommend it, even if it's just a little something. All right. So diversifying protein sources for the vegetarian runners, another question we have. So this can be just looking towards, you know, the sources that you do have available. So um, soy, beet, soy sources like tofu and tempeh, if you're consuming them, um, beans, and then so uh, beans and rice have differing and varying um, amino acids. They are very complementary. Um, there are a lot of different kinds of protein sources. Um, that are plant-based. And so I think just trying to get as much variety as possible. If you are a lacto ovo vegetarian, that makes it even easier because you're incorporating dairy and eggs as well. And because you're getting in some animal products, you're actually getting in some of that B12 that I was mentioning that some plant-based um, foods are, they're not going to have that. So uh, that's my, my suggestion and my recommendation. Um, for those who maybe are very, very limited in their protein sources, um, it might be worth, you know, meeting with a dietitian to talk about what, how much protein you're having, is it enough? And also like, what about the other nutrients? So being a plant-based runner, there are other nutrients beyond protein content that you will also fall short in. So if there is any trouble getting protein, it could be worth um, checking in on it. But 
diversity from the sense of, you know, tofu, dairy and eggs, beans, um, and all these different sources. If you can find that variety day to day, um, that's, that's great. Okay, so this is the um, a similar question to above. So your advice to a runner who does not have an appetite prior to an early morning practice on a workout day, should we try to force a small meal and snack before? Um, if it, Again, if it's a longer practice, longer than 30-ish minutes, I would recommend getting in something. And it doesn't have to be um, a full, you know, full, full meal, full breakfast. It could be that we're getting in something with a little carbohydrate, um, even grabbing a granola bar and breaking off pieces of granola bar and eating that as you can, utilizing a sports drink if you need to, if your stomach is not really um, accustomed to having food in the morning. Um, getting in something will be probably more beneficial, especially for the longer, definitely for the longer practices, but even for the shorter ones, if you could tolerate a little bit. Thank you all for listening and for your questions. <laughs> Great. Um, we're going to have Sarah go now. I'm going to spotlight you. She is live from the McKaylee Center where we normally have these lectures. So it's nice to see that backdrop. Good to be here. <laughs> All right. So good morning, everybody. So let me just share my screen here. And then we can get started. And since I didn't close anything here, there we go. All right. All right, and there we go. So thank you everybody for joining us this morning. Um, like I said, it's great to be here back at the McKaylee Center. Um, so, you know, it kind of gives us a little bit of sense of that normalcy. Um, and, you know, it just seems like every day we're kind of inching there little by little, which is great. So uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is, um, is running strong at every level. So whether you are, you know, in COVID, a lot of people took up running because it was kind of the only form of exercise that was really available with, with gyms not being around or, you know, not being able to go to regular fitness classes or anything like that and having the opportunity to go outside, of course. So I wanted to talk about just something that could, or, or just um, strengthening and flexibility and just kind of all parts of fitness that could benefit any sort of any runner at any level from the couch to 5k to your trained marathon runner. So what we'll be talking about today is we're just going to talk about you generally being a runner. Um, you know, so some people come in and, you know, they don't really like consider them, they want to get into running, but they don't really consider themselves much of a runner because they can hardly get through a mile. That's fine. You are still a runner if you have that mindset there. Um, so I want to just talk about um, you are running, prepare, how you can prepare to get strong for running, your running readiness, um, things to consider with your training program. Um, then, you know, the highlight of today are live action demonstrations there. Uh, when to seek help. And uh, I'm going to do a little um, highlight on gait retraining and then just uh, finish things up with some takeaways. All right. So um, fair to mention, um, much like Chris, uh, Dr. Whitney and Nicole, I am also a marathon runner. Um, I did that, you know, normal um, ballet dancer, swimmer to marathon training um, progression there. So a very different style of running there. So I've completed four marathons now um, and never in my life, if you asked me 10 years ago if I would have ran a marathon, I never would have I said, yes, I have done that. Um, so it's a pretty cool accomplishment accomplishment to have. Um, and I absolutely love the training for it. Um, I sometimes the race day is great, but I actually love the training a bit more for it. Um, so, um, you know, right now, not really doing much of that kind of sticking between about the 5k pace there, but uh, hopefully one day when things start to open up again, you can get back at that starting line there. All right. So, um, for everyone else out there, let's think about when you are ready to run. So I think it's important when you start running to figure out why you're interested in it. So like I mentioned, you know, over the past year, a lot of people got into it because it was something, sometimes it was just something to do, um, you know, lack of other resources to exercise. Um, so are you starting to run or continue to run for fitness? 
Are you doing it for fun? Are you looking for performance? Or are you actually doing it for sport? So uh, when you are looking for a program to train for or seeking help in how to train for something like that, it's important to know that because everything is, it, it, the way that you train is gonna be different for each of those. Um, then the next thing to consider is what your experience with running is. So like I said, if you've never you know, run before in your life, it does not mean that you can't get out there and, and start something there, all right? Um, some people get into running after a bit of a hiatus, but maybe they were a, um, a high level runner in high school or college, and then they took some time off and now they're looking to get back into it. Um, or, or maybe they were a former athlete or current athlete in a sport that doesn't do much uh, distance running. So that's another thing to consider because that is uh, that is a bit of a transition, even for sports like um, soccer and lacrosse, where there is a fair amount of running. Running forward for X amount of time is very different than changing direction uh, on a field there. So that would be something to, to consider there. Um, when people are can have consistently run through the years, you know, we, we all know those people that have run three miles every day for the past like 25 years. Um, they're very admirable folks there. Um, and then to think that if you if you have run in the past, in the past um, every time you run, you end up getting injured. Um, you know, I work with a lot of a lot of individuals that try to do the couch to 5K and then they get to like two and a half miles and then bam, IT band syndrome. And they've tried that five times. So that's where we want to figure out what is missing in the program. Uh, and what we have to do to try to kind of get you over that hump and why you're consistently hitting that kind of roadblock at that time there. Um, and as we all know, you know, whether you absolutely love running or like, eh, with it, we, there's always a love-hate relationship. So uh, that can also factor in with like how we're going to plan to, to train and train for you there. Um, so, uh, we also want to look at your fitness level. So this kind of ties into what both Nicole and or Whitney were talking about and just, you know, showing up and just being as healthy as you can. So we want to make sure first and foremost that exercise is okayed by your doctor, all right? So especially if you are a person who has dealt with a lot of injuries or is taking um, medications that can alter your blood pressure or heart rate or even like kind of increase like potential fatigue, it's important to clear that first with your physician have that information so that, you know, we can, because you might, you know, ramp up your running in a different way and it might even affect nutrition, all these things like that. So it's just important to make sure that we have that under control there. Um, we want to see if you are currently active in any sort of strength and conditioning program, taking fitness classes or potentially just going to the gym there. So naturally, the more physically active you are, the easier the transition will be to running. Uh, longer distances, whatever they may be like. Um, sedentary lifestyle, I mean, let's face it, we all sat in our butts a ton <laughs> over the past year. Um, so we're all maybe a little bit more sedentary than we usually are. I know I sure am. So, you know, but that changes things, you know, when you're getting back into running, you just can't go, oh, you know, I sat on my butt for eight months, now I'm going to go back to training for a marathon. You have to gradually get yourself there. And don't worry, that is not the last time you're going to hear me say that. Um, we also want to think about sleep, stress, and diet. Um, truthfully, I kind of consider those three of the biggest things when we're looking at a strength program or progressing your running training program. If you're not sleeping well, you're not going to perform well. Uh, if you are under stress, your body's going to handle, you know, kind of these stresses from physical activity very differently. And then, of course, if you're not fueling well, like Nicole just gave a beautiful presentation on, that's also going to affect how you're going to be able to strength train. Um, and train out on the road there. And like I mentioned, you know, factoring in things like injuries, medications, any sort of medical conditions. Um, there are a lot of folks out there that have, you know, really overcome odds. I've worked with a lot of runners who have um, overcome cancer and but are still have some lingering effects from chemotherapy or radiation, which does just a number on you. So the way that we, again, we want to train those folks is going to be a little bit differently because we have to consider that they might fatigue a little bit sooner. All right, and the big thing I share with all of my athletes, 
before you move well as an athlete, you need to move well first as a human. So best example, if uh, you can't squat well, or in other words, sit down well, like you kind of lower yourself and flop or something like that, we need to work on that form. Because if you don't have good mobility, if you don't have, um, uh, if you're lacking in strength in certain areas, that is going to show up when you're running. I kind of consider running to be one of the most vulnerable things that we can do for our body. So anything that is kind of off kilter or whatnot is going to show up in our running form. Um, so big parts that we want to make sure are moving well is we want to make sure that the ankle and the hip are especially moving well. Um, also, I didn't add this in here, but we also want to factor in that, you know, that the even the shoulders are moving well. So again, now all of us are kind of in this hunched position. If we're in this hunched position, that could greatly affect how we're even able to do some strengthening exercises and how we run, it's gonna pull us forward more. So being able to move the shoulders while we get those back there, it's gonna help with overall posture. Therefore, it's gonna help with your ability to, to move forward with the running there. We want strong everything, but especially glutes and glute medius. So that's just the part of the glute that kind of rides high in the hip. Again, I'll be talking a lot about that. It's one of, your glutes are really your most important running muscle. Uh, we want strong hamstrings, we want uh, strong calves, abdominals, lower abdominals especially. Um, if you are a person who knows that their pelvis tends to tip forward when they're running, or if you are a woman that has had um, any pregnancies or whatnot, that is something that unfortunately just kind of settles in there. So we really want to make sure that we have strong lower abdominals because that could really affect how your mechanics of your pelvis work and could increase some hip flexor um, tightness that uh, because your hip flexors end up taking over for and trying to stabilize you a little bit more and that was just not totally their job for what those lower abdominals may be lacking there. And then of course, foot intrinsics there, which I think our poor feet, even though they are doing stuff for us all the time, particularly when we're running, they just do not get the attention that they deserve. So we're gonna give it to them today. Um, we want stable core and hips. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit more later about the difference between stability and strength. They kind of dance along the same line, um, but they are very different there. And then since you know we have a, uh, and then flexibility, we wanna make sure that we have good hamstring, um, calf hip flexor, quad glute flexibility. Uh, we don't want to be over flexible because if you are overly stretched, like, you know, like I mentioned, I'm coming from a dance background. So I do have some parts of me that are very stretched out. Um, stretching them more isn't necessarily the, the thing to do, even though they may feel tight. I have to work on more strengthening for that area to compensate for that extra mobility that, that, that you may have there. Okay. Um, and like I mentioned, since we have an audience that is filled with physical therapists, doctors, athletic trainers, for strength and conditioning coaches, um, and just people who just enjoy running, um, I wanted to take a bit of a perspective where you can kind of uh, take a look at yourself um, and see if you can kind of test yourself in these ways um, or other ways that uh, you as a pr practitioner could look at your, your athletes as you're working with them. So for cardiovascular fitness, there, uh, even though I searched and searched for this, there's actually really no defined criteria for cardiovascular fit or like how your cardiovascular system has to be for when you run out there, right? But I did find that um, the American College of Sports Medicine does recommend at least being able to um, maintain a moderate intensity exercise level. So that's about like a, like a five. I know we're all familiar with scales there on the modified Borg scale or RPE scale for about 30 minutes, about three times per week. So it's pretty much like one of like the basic, just like fitness recommendations there. So if you can do that, good chances are that you can start a running program. All right. And then we're going to start looking at how we're moving, all right? So like I mentioned, running puts us at our most vulnerable position. So if there's any sort of like kink in the system there, we're going to see it when you run. So it's good to just make sure that we analyze movement to make sure that we're not missing anything that could be uh, thrown off when you are running. So um, looking at mobility and flexibility, all right? So mobility kind of pertains more to how the joint moves. Uh, our flexibility kind of pertains more to how the muscle can stretch there, right? Just, just in case there's a little bit of a, 
um, discrepancy on what those definitions mean. Um, so we're looking at um, inline lunch. And this is a great one for runners because it's a very compound movement because after all, you know, it's not just our ankles that are propelling us forward, it's the whole package. So, you know, if the ankle doesn't move well, that's gonna affect the hip and then the poor knee falls in the middle of it and then blah, 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 blah. we just kind of roll into this whole situation. So um, doing an inline lunge, as you can see in the, in the picture here, uh, this gentleman has a bolster behind his back. This is typically how we look at our runners here at the McKaylee Center. Um, so he's maintaining good posture and he's able to lunge all the way down. Um, so it, it's able to look at your ankle dorsiflexion or your ability to um, get your foot to pick up here. Um, your hip flexor flexibility, your hip extension, and hip flexion as a whole unit, all right? And it also looks a little bit at your, at your core stability as well. So if you don't have good core stability or you're tight in the shoulders, you might be a little wobbly on that board there. Um, hamstring stretch with a strap. So you want to make sure that your knee is straight for this one. And wherever you can, so this is a way that you can test yourself. Um, if you are a practitioner, um, this is pretty similar to doing an active street leg raise in the FMS system. Um, but if you put a strap around your foot and see where your hamstring lands with a straight leg, you may be surprised where it ends up there, okay? So ideally, you want to get everybody to about 90 degrees. Um, so that, that would be the end goal with all of that. But check out and see where you're at. Uh, big toe extension, like I said. <laughs> Our, our poor feet just don't get enough here. So a big thing with running is being able to pick those, those guys up there, right, individually. Now I know you're all sitting in your chairs now trying to pick up your big toes at home. <laughs> I know your moves. Um, but if you can't move well through that big toe and you can't separate how that big toe moves compared to the, to the little guys there, that's gonna throw up how you're gonna be able to push off and your push off affects how you're going to land. So that would be a really big thing to make sure that you, you can work on and get that toe moving well. Um, and then we're looking at balance. So um, for some of the criteria for this stuff, I just kind of went through the research and just looked at what was like normally recommended for a test there. So single leg balance, we're looking at about 30 seconds there. Um, you know, just one leg up, pretty simple. Uh, next, we are looking at some strength, okay? So core pretty, or, uh, for core strength, we're looking at our plank, so pretty universal measurement. We're looking, see if you can hold a plank with good form for about 30 to 90 seconds, okay? Um, so what I mean by good form, that you're able to have your elbows right underneath your shoulders, you um, don't have any sway in your back or your butt's not sticking up there, um, and that you can maintain that form for the entire duration of that test there. Um, when we're looking at the hamstring and glute, a single leg um, bridge is a great way to look at your strength. So two ways you can look at it. You can either do reps, um, 10 to 30 reps, or you can hold it for 60 seconds to look more at gluteal endurance. Uh, for the calf, single leg raise is a great way because, uh, you know, as we all know, when we're running, we're always on one leg. So being able to do that multiple times, um, important because when we're running, we're essentially doing that, well, multiple times. Um, and then for the upper body, we want to look at the trunk push up. So this does pertain a bit to more to the core. But again, just because you are a runner and maybe, you know, and you're not, you know, you're not lifting or anything like that. If you have good strong arms, that's going to affect your posture in a huge way. All right. So looking at your trunk push up. So the, the gentleman in the top uh, corner of your screen there, he's identifying it. So it's, it's a little different than a push up. It's, it's pretty hard uh, to do, but a great way to look at your overall control. Uh, when we're looking at more functional strength, we want to see that you are able to perform single leg hops for about either 30 seconds in place. You can hop for 20 yards distance. That's um, how we test you here at the McKaylee Center. Uh, even looking at your ability to do a single leg box jump. Um, you know, you don't have to go too crazy with that one, but at least a six inch box jump can tell you that you can, you know, propel yourself enough uh, to move forward there. Uh, single leg squat. Um, walking lunges, um, there isn't a better way to kind of analyze how things are going to work than a walking lunge because it's basically breaking down running in a way. Um, and then a farmer carry, so that's where you hold 
two weights by your sides at about 50% of your weight. All right. So the reason why this one is super important is because when you are running, there's tons of forces going on, right? There's your body weight, there's gravity, there's ground reaction forces. There's a whole stuff, a whole bunch of stuff going on. And then your core kind of sits in the middle there. So you need to be able to hold 50% of your body weight because when you land, you're ideally landing somewhere between one and a half to two times your body weight, okay? So that tells us that you are strong enough to be able to withstand those forces before something starts to kind of break down there. Um, a lot of runners that we see in here are landing much more um, than that. So we try to get them down to be able to do that one and a half to two times their body weight uh, with different training mechanics there. All right. Other things to consider with your training program. Uh, I mean, the big goals of any training program, like I said, regardless of what you're looking to train for, uh, we want to look at your metabolic economy. So that's your ability to maintain your energy for the duration of the activity. So, you know, I already think that Dr. Whitney and Nicole did a great job explaining all of that there. Um, and the part that I'm going to share with you guys is how strength factors into your metabolic economy there. Um, we want to look at your power output. All right. So, you know, great way to look at that is jumping, which, you know, loosely is involved in running there. Um, but it's that same motion in terms of accelerating or like, you know, going up a hill, things like that. So we want to be able to get yourself to propel yourself forward. And then, like I mentioned, absorbing your, your body weight or being able to absorb your body weight, gravity, ground reaction forces, all that stuff. So how do you absorb your forces? So can you, can you take the impact of running? Um, and if, again, there's something in the system that isn't working, that impact is going to show up somewhere. And it's never the same. Like I can't look at, you know, when we're doing gait analysis with runners and we notice that they have an overstep. So one of those common things that we see, and that's simply when the foot lands in front of the knee. All right. Uh, we know that that causes a breaking motion, but I can't say that everybody who has an overstep is going to end up with a shin injury because they don't. Some of them have hamstring stuff. Some of them have low back things, knee things, you name it, things show up. So it kind of affects your, like, I kind of think of it as it affects like your weakest link there. Um, so we want to make sure that you can absorb those forces as well. Um, and that there really isn't one size fits model for all runners. Um, Dr. Whitney shared a great plan for, for, the, for the marathon training um, and how to break it down by every level. Um, but just because maybe you have like, like myself, I've run four marathons, but I'm not looking to, to win Boston. Um, maybe when I'm like 90 or something, I don't know. But um, I would fall still, even though I had this experience, I'd still fall kind of like in the more like beginner type category because that's just where my body is, but even following a plan like that, I'm able to, to, you know, make improvements and everything with my training. So um, it kind of depends. Again, there's a lot of factors. So it's very individualized in terms of um, how you kind of get there. But um, for some people, not, you know, if you're a marathon, if you're training for a marathon, running 50 plus miles might not be the right thing for you. Sometimes a little bit lower mileage, higher on cross training is the perfect fit for you. Some people can do 75, 100 miles per week, and, and that's what's right for them. Uh, for, our, for our like shorter distance or cross-country runners who we work with a lot here at the McKaylee Center, um, you know, I'm hearing that they're running like 50, 60 miles a week, and I'm like, I don't even do that when I'm training for a marathon. Um, so again, there are some individuals can, that can do that, but it's not for everyone. Sometimes just having good quality runs about 15 miles a week is going to get you to, you know, get stronger and faster and accomplish your goals. Um, and then another thing, and this is more of a confidence boost again for those out there, just because if you're running three miles a week, it doesn't make you any less than a runner who was training in a marathon. You are a runner, so know that. So, you know, buy all your fancy gear, uh, sleep well, eat well, do all of that stuff, train well, you are a runner. All right. And then what are we looking at for and moving forward with, uh, with your program? Um, the best way to improve your running is to practice, is to get out there, all right? So it's, it's not just going to happen on its own. Um, a conversation we have a lot with, with our runners here, whether if they're in gate retraining or um, they're preparing for a season, um, sitting down is not going to get you there. So you need to get out there and actually practice those skills. Uh, we want to plan for, you know, the distance and time that you plan on being out there. You want to make small increases per week. So again, every runner is a little different. So we really focus on individualized programs here at the McKaylee Center. 
Um, but I'd say on average is about five to 10% increase per week. Uh, rules of threes, um, that's the kind of the formula that I like. So if you're going out for a run and let's say you're starting out there and you wanna get to, you're starting out with a mile, be able to successfully run a mile three times and then the next week increase that mileage to about like one and a quarter, one and a half, you have three successful runs. Um, if at any time you find that, you know, that like the run didn't go well or you're noticing that you're having pain, um, we use the three out of 10 pain model there, uh, either during up to 36 hours after a run there, um, then we would call that an unsuccessful run. So then you would want to keep the mileage lower. And then, and then if that continues, that's when we might want to seek help. But I'll, I'll share that in a little bit there. Uh, walk run programs are also great, uh, regardless of your experience. This is a great one for a beginner runner. It's also great for those who have been kind of working with injuries for a while. Um, this is also a great plan too, if like life is a little chaotic and then you decided that training for something is just gonna kind of be your outlet, but you're maybe lacking in sleep, maybe nutrition's not great or whatnot, incorporating a walk run program is a great thing too, just to kind of, again, get your mileage in there, but you know, be a little bit easier on your body. And then you can kind of, and then when you do have those moments where things are kind of lining up better, that's when you can kind of focus on that quality there. Um, and then again, quality of runs over the quantity of runs. That's important for really any mileage that you're doing. Um, training is cumulative, all right? So that includes mixing in the cross training there. That does affect it, whether you're riding the bike, getting in the pool, lifting, all of that stuff. That helps build your running plan, all right? Uh, not every runner needs to run six days a week. Um, again, some can, but you do want to factor in days for rest. Um, rest is where you make your build. That's where you, that's where all of your work for that week comes to a head. And that day is super, super important. All right. And then just a quick thing of cross training before I start getting into, into some uh, exercises here. Um, so it allows for a break for the repetitiveness of running. Um, you know, you're going forward, same cycle for, you know, X amount of miles there. So being able to just challenge your muscles in a different way is huge. Um, it, it decreases your risk of injury. Um, you're able to work on any sort of like strength or stability deficits that might be kind of lost while you're training for your event there. Um, mentally, it feels pretty good to do that, especially if you're in a long training cycle. Um, and you can strength train throughout the training cycle. Um, that, you know, that, that is a common misconception that I hear from some of my runners, but it's nice to hear that that's getting actually out there with more coaches are, are, are um, encouraging their athletes to do more strength training and everything like that. So that's music to our ears here, um, but it's an important part of what you're doing when you're out there training. All right. And then <laughs> we knew this slide was coming there. <laughs> Glutes. All right. So most important thing that they, they help with your ability to stabilize yourself on one leg. They help propel you forward. They do everything and they kind of help, they assist the hip flexor as you bring that knee forward. They do everything for you there. And they're a huge cause for a lot of injuries um, or just faulty mechanics in general there. If the glutes aren't working well, that could cause your hip flexors to tighten up. It could cause more of a pelvic drop. So that's when the hips kind of sway side to side too much. Um, it can cause an increase in tight calves um, or hamstring strain if, um, if they're not working well because they have to work together as a team. Um, a lot of times they'll have runners come through and their calves are bonkers tight and we notice that they're not really using their glutes to extend the hip. And the way that I explain it is if you look at the size and location of your calf compared to the glute, who should be doing more work? Your butt. Right. Um, and, you know, and one thing that has that happens in general, I mean, before COVID, when we all had like crazy lives or just kind of running around everywhere um, or sitting long periods, um, which is something that we've kind of all faced um, over the past year there, sitting on your butt more is going to cause your hip flexors to tighten up more. And it's going to um, get your glutes to actually turn off it. And it's going to, they're, it are not going to be able to fire as well as they could have been if you were, you know, like walking more, um, using them more. So um, if you are a new runner or runner that's looking to get back into things, uh, now that again, things are looking like they're starting to open up there, I'd say one of the first areas to address would be your glute strength. Um, 
because um, as you can see, it pushes you forward, helps hip stability, and helps with your endurance there. All right, so here's the part we came for, right? We're gonna start to get into some exercises. So any of the um, exercises that I have listed in blue, I'm going to be doing a demonstration of, um, and then anything that is listed in black, those are some of the exercises that I have pictures of here. So first one, so pardon me as I get a little too close to the screen. Um, so we are gonna start with some hip mobility. All right, so I really like, there you go, you can see me half fine here. Um, so I really like movements that are going to not just focus on one joint or one area of the body, because that's, again, like I mentioned, that's not what's happening when you're running. Everything has to move together. So first what we're going to look at is a little something for the hips. So lizard stretch, if you're familiar with yoga at all, this is where it comes from. So one foot's going to go in front. And then hands come down to the inside of the leg. Um, if it's hard to get your hands down to the inside to the floor, prop them up, yoga blocks, books, whatever you got there, bring the floor closer to you. So hands go down and then you're gonna slide your knee back a little bit. So you can see here my knee is hugging in towards my shoulder. And then I can, this way, my core is actually supported. So it allows me to let my hips drop. Whereas with like a traditional hip flexor stretch, just for comparison here, you can see if you can stabilize here, go forward, that's great. If not, we see a lot of this going on there. All right. So hands here, shoulder or knee squeezed into the shoulder. And the first variation I'm going to do is a hip opener. So I'm going to squeeze my knee in, open the knee out to the side. So I might go on the outside edge of the foot. In and out. So here I'm getting both the inside of my hip, outside of my hip, arm up. The second variation I'm going to share with you guys, and it's not going see you can see. We're going to keep that knee squeezed in towards the shoulder, but we're going to add a bit of a quad stretch. So keeping the knee here, we're going to move the heel towards your butt, straighten the leg. So some people feel this a little bit of the hip flexor in the quad, but it's a good way just to kind of floss things out there. What you want to watch for if you're doing this is that you start to bend the knee and the butt pops up. Only move within a range of motion where the hips don't want to move. All right, so there's our lizard stretches. The next one we're going to do is a hip and ankle floss. So we're going to go into a half kneeling position again. Toe curls under the back so we can get a, work a little bit on that big toe there. And then this helps with hip flexor mobility and some hamstring mobility. So again, hold on to something if you need to, but you're going to move yourself forward, activate your boot first, move yourself forward for about a count of five. So you'll start to feel a little bit of a stretch to the front of the hip, keep the heel down, relax to the front of the ankle. And then you're going to start to move yourself through your starting position again, Send the hips back, hands come down to the ground, keep the toe down. So now we're actually getting a little bit of a stretch to the front of the shin here, and you're getting a stretch through a kind of a really tight area of your hamstring there. The goal is to try to send the hips back towards the heel, but that happen. You can also see that my knee isn't totally straight. That's fine. The, the focus here is to just kind of work between the two spots when you're running there. But again, you usually get a little picked up there. All right, next one hip circles. So it's good to have good range of motion throughout the whole hip joint. So we're gonna go into, onto hands and knees here into a tabletop position. So push the floor away, feel the core activate, and then you're gonna bend your knee. So imagine that you, and you can even physically do this, put like a pen behind your knee to keep that knee bent. You don't want that knee to straighten during this exercise. Also watch if the hip doesn't wanna sway. We're gonna move forward, come all the way up to the side, and then we're going to rotate in and down, out, in, and down. So I usually have my athletes do that about five times going forwards and then reversing it back, out, forward, just like so. You can make these as big or as small as you want. Um, important that if you do get any like gripping or tightness or anything funny goes on in that hip there, you can still do this motion just make it a little bit smaller. 
um, because those things will start to work out as you um, as you do this exercise there. And then the last um, mobility exercise I want to go over is something that kind of combines everything in the running motion. So it's a heel sit. I'll show you the whole motion here, um, but you can kind of work with whatever at whatever phase works best for you. So I am sitting on my heels here. I have to put my hands on top of my head so then that way I know that I'm only just using my body. My arms aren't really helping me in this. So we go from a heel sit position to tall kneeling. Good point to kind of check and tone up the abs. Um, squeeze the glutes. Then you're going to step through to a half kneeling position and have your hip, knee, and toe line up. All right. So things we want to watch for as you're transitioning is that that doesn't happen. All right. So you're going to try to get that movement as smooth as you can. Then we're going to come up, push to the front foot. Here we are. Woo! In our knee drive. <laughs> Hello, balance today. All right. So I have, you can see that there's a space between my knee and my heel as we want it when we're running. And then I'm going to open my arms out to the side and keep my leg up nice and high. And I'm, woo, I'm taking it back to an airplane. All right. Hip square. My toe is facing down. Then I'm going to reverse that motion. Come on up, knee drive, half kneeling, tall kneeling, sit down. That's one. Uh, again, for these things, I kind of have everyone do about five of them on each side. Um, and last exercise I demonstrated, great to just kind of, if you notice that that hip wings out, we want to make sure that we can kind of drive that knee forward there. All right, so let's see. I just have to get back to my, there we go. Thanks, Stace. <laughs> oh, why isn't that working? There we go. All right, so next we have our activation. All right, so I'm gonna demonstrate the butterflies and hip wake ups. So for our butterflies, which I consider one of my woodiest exercises here, um, I'm going to demonstrate this on a ball. You can do this in a bridge position, but you'll want a mini band or some sort of exercise band. And you're going to put the band around just above both of the knees. And then start seated on the ball here. You're going to walk out so that your head and your shoulders are supported by the ball. Hips up. Squeeze the glutes. And then you're gonna do little pulses with the band. It's almost like butterfly wings there. You wanna watch if the knees don't wanna whack in towards each other because that's what the band is gonna to try to get you to do. And then come on back up. So I like that one for just general boot activation there. Next, we're gonna do some hip wake ups. All right, so one common thing that we see on a lot of runners is that they drop their knee into balance. So, oops, wrong place there. Um, so what this does is it kind of trains them to get out of that valgus there. So this is a little bit lower than I would ideally have this set up. So you yeah, can see it a little bit better. Um, so I would have something that's about the same height as their knee. And then you're gonna put the band, because I need a little bit more space here just above the inside of their knee there, find a split squat position. So you're holding a static split squat, and then you're gonna move the knee in, and then control the knee out so that the kneecap lines up right over the second toe. In, follow up. And where you'll feel it, inside of the thigh, and then this very specific spot just behind your hip bone here. So that starts to turn your glute minimus in. And then last activation trick I'm gonna show you here are some leg lowers, all right? So these are great for acti activating the core. And the other thing I love about these is that you're able to stretch your calf out a bit and your hamstring out at the same time. So you want a band. Uh, something a little stretch in it isn't a bad idea, especially if you have really tight hamstrings. And what you're gonna do is lie down, and you're going to put the band in your other shoe this side here around the bottom of your foot. 
and then stretch the leg up towards the ceiling, reaching with your heel. So you don't want to pull the toe towards your face. Reaching through the heel will allow that to happen naturally there. You do want to make sure that the leg is straight for this. Shoulders relaxed, and then tone up the abdominals. Imagine that you're lifting this leg up from somewhere around the rib cage, and that way we know that we're getting the psoas involved here. Tone up the core, and then float the leg up to match the other side. Holding on to the abdominals, you're going to lower the leg down and then lightly tap the core. So you do not want the leg to plunk down there. All right. If doing this just with a strap is a little hard because those hamstrings are really tight, you can use an assist with a wall or maybe a box like I'm demonstrating here. Reach out through the heel. And then that's just gonna limit the range a little bit, especially tight hamstrings or if those hip flexors feel like they're gripping at all during that exercise. All right. And we move into our close up again and then other activation exercises, like I mentioned, psoas activation, um, single leg glute bridges there, and then some toe and heel walks. Next for our strengthening, all right. Um, core strengthening here, we're going to do a plank with a knee drive. So finding your high plank position. And this kind of connects what the glute or your hip extension is going to do as you drive the knee forward. It's important to have those two connections there. So we're in our high plank, we are going to be about hip swift distance. Extend one leg up, fire up the glute, leg float up. Drive the knee towards the elbow on the same side. Extend out, drive. All right, so for this one again, watch that the butt doesn't want to start to go up or that leg doesn't want to start to drop down. All right, of course, doing that on both sides, super helpful. Uh, next, we're going to get into our flying squirrels. Fun name here. Let me get my band. And we're back. All right, so. If you're worried that your glutes are a little bit on the sleepy side, this is a great way to wake those up. We're gonna take the band, take it up above both of the knees, and then you're gonna lie down on your stomach. Arms are gonna come to a goal post position by your sides, and you're gonna move your knees out and your heels together. Normally you'd be looking down towards the ground, but I wanna look at you guys today. So from here, you're going to lift your arms, your chest, and your legs up off the ground while pushing the knees out against the side. So going on up, hold for about three seconds, and then come on down. Up, hold, and come on down. This is also a great way to kind of identify if maybe one glute is a little bit stronger or more powerful than the other side. Um, I know with myself, my left glute always kind of struggles a bit to match that right side there. But it, this exercise gives you feedback that you're able to maybe push a little bit more of that side that feels like it's not firing as well. Um, so great, great, great exercise. Not just for running, I'd say for every sport there, right? And then I'll demonstrate three-way hamstrings. So I guarantee almost everybody in our audience today has done some variation of these. But I like these because we do the hamstring curls or the hamstring exercises one after the other after the other. So it really gets the whole spectrum of that hamstring there. So ideal for having an exercise ball. You're going to put your feet up on the ball. Like straight arms up to the side. So first one, I have everybody kind of start with five of each of these. I'll demonstrate by just doing three. The legs straight, lift the hips up, squeeze the glutes. We're going to do that three times. Then I'm going to keep my hips up, bend the knees so they're about 90 degrees here, so kind of like in an elevated bridge. Bridge is here. All right, here, the hips stay up. Straighten the legs all the way up, and then we're curling the ball to our butt. 
full handshake curl. So we'll definitely have something to say during this exercise here. Um, start lower because some hamstrings may be a little bit more tolerable of this exercise at different places and they might feel like they want to cramp or something in the, in the middle. You can always stretch your bow roll in between if they're a little cranky. That's usually temporary because we're just overloading the muscle a bit. Um, so as your muscle starts to make those adaptations, uh, you won't have that sensation after a little while there. Uh, and of course, you can do this exercise both double or single leg. Um, other areas, side plank, any variation of a side plank, Copenhagen plank, love these because again, they address kind of the inside of the thigh or the adductors. And we spend so much time strengthening everything on the outside, especially the glutes. We want to make sure that we have a good balance between the inside and the outside of the legs. And then I love hip thrusters, not just because they're harder than bridges, but they're also just really good for kind of getting that like power output when you're running. All right, continuing with our strengthening there. A lot of these exercises probably look pretty familiar to everybody, but one that I wanted to demonstrate that's a little bit of a take on a deadlift or a single leg deadlift rather, is using a bolster. So this can be a little bit more geared towards um, our practitioners out there who are working with athletes. So if you notice and you test somebody and they're going into an airplane position or going into their deadlift and they're kind of doing that thing or this thing and all of those weird versions of it, you do want to make sure that that flying leg is activated because when you're running, you're going to need that activation there. So one way I try to correct that with some runners is if you take like a small foam roller or some sort of bolster and place it on the wall and on the inside of your knee. And it can kind of just like sit wherever it works best for the athlete. This one's a little hard to set up, but once you get there, it works up just fine. All right, so we're standing on one leg. This is going to force you to keep the hips straight. All right, so we're here. I'm just going to demonstrate my stretching arms out. Glutes activated. We're going to move forward and up. Forward and up. And even though it may seem like, oh, the person may twist their knee or do something like that, I haven't had that experience. Everybody tends to really do it job keeping everything nice and lined up. If you have a person that does have a hard time or anytime they drop into a single leg exercise and their, their foot wants to turn in or they're really under valves or anything like that, same idea, put the bolster on the outside of the knee. So then that way they can push into the bolster to help make that correction. Uh, next one I'm going to demonstrate are some split squat variations. So uh, we have your standard goblet splits split squat uh, or your rear foot elevator Bulgarian split squat. But two I find really helpful for runners um, let me put it here, is doing an alternating grip. So holding on to a kettlebell or weight on one side, drop into your split squat, come on up, change sides to the other side. I'm kind of alternating between those two sides there. So that's going to help the body guess a little bit more. Um, and then one with rotation. So again, this ties in core stability, inner thigh, outside of the leg. Holding onto the weight. As you descend into the split squat, you're gonna turn, come on back up. Turn, come on back up. And that's a great one to do because again, with running, we're always going forward, forward, forward. We don't get a ton of rotation, but we need to have good rotation as a human. Uh, next one we'll go over is a big step up. So everyone kind of knows step ups. This is basically a play on that. So it teaches you, closer you guys here, to knock everything over here. Use your quads and your hamstrings a little bit more together and to use the calf a little bit less to kind of push you up there. So it kind of helps just work on stabilizing as you make contact with the ground. So you'll start here, you want the foot to be pretty close to the box. You're gonna to start to shift your weight forward. All right, keep the heel press down and then use all the strength of this leg to help bring you up to standing or maybe even into a knee drag if you're looking to make this a bit more functional. 
Then you shift the shoulders forward, bend the knee, keep that quick knee toe alignment, come on down. This is one that I don't have runners do like 10 of. I usually have them do maybe like five or six per side. You don't need to do a lot of these in order to get a good or big impact with these. So yeah, this, these are currently one of my hot exercises that everyone's getting these days. Um, and love that. You can do various plays on that as well. And then the last strengthening exercise I want to review with everybody is something that I call a calf torture. You can take that second word <laughs> as you want. Um, people have very different definitions of what that torture means. Um, but I love this because it helps again with force absorption and it helps strengthen the soleus and the gastroc. So when you're landing, you want good soleus strength in order to help absorb forces when you land. And then on push off, you want to make sure that you have, have good strength and range of motion to help push you forward for when you get into that kick. All right. So one knee in front, bent, I'm holding onto weights here. And don't need a crazy amount of weight. I usually get my athletes somewhere between 10 to 15 pounds on each hand. Bend the knee so you have a little bit of an ankle lean. Watch that this business doesn't start to happen there. All right, and then you're going to go up onto your toes. So you can see I'm working my gas drop in the back leg, slowly in the front, lower down. Back leg has to stay straight, front leg stays bent. And you can do different variations of this where you can put their knee, um, using a ball against the wall or a foam roller or whatnot, especially if the, if the athlete tends to want to drop in. It just helps good keep good hip knee toe alignment there. Um, and then other important exercise is doing a single leg squat. That's super important for having good mid stance alignment, eccentric calf raises, and then of course some foot doming and a four corner foot drill there. Um, next, we're going to look at our stabilizing exercises. So. Farmer marches, carries, you can do them unilateral. I like those for stability. You could do it with two if you wanted to. Uh, the half kneeling overhead press. Uh, that's simply where you're in the half kneeling position, raising the arm up. And then the one I'll demonstrate is a lateral lunge to a high knee. So uh, I'm really trying to focus a lot on getting inside that leg to match what we're doing on the outside here. So one leg's gonna stay in place. And you're gonna lunge out to the side, have that hip knee toe alignment, anchor down through the outside edge of the foot, push up to your high knee. So you're essentially trying to throw yourself off balance. And you can make this harder by folding onto a band. So then it's kind of try to pull in. You have to kind of overcome those forces. You get a little bit more core activation with it, which is awesome. So lots of different ways that you can make this exercise challenging. Um, and then plyos here. So um, great plyos. Plyos are super important for running because after all, you are going one foot to the other and you need to have that. And again, it's just going to help with force absorption, which is really what we want out of running. So um, jump rope, box jumps, death jumps, hops again, and then some push hops. So there's an image there of the forwards one where somebody has their foot on a step, then they push up, change sides, push up, change sides. I'm going to demonstrate a lateral one. So I'm going to use a Bosu ball for this. You could use a regular like rebound step or something like that to kind of do this exercise as well. So we're going to start on one side here. Make sure that's that spot there. So then you're going to push, explode up towards the ceiling, land on the other side. Push, land, push, land. Go get to work. Not just on your plyometrics, we get to work on stabilizing the hips. So great exercise for a lot of things there. All right, and then lastly, what we'll talk about um, are some stretching. So lots of different ways to stretch hamstrings, quads, hip flexors, all of that stuff there. Again, I like ones that kind of compound muscle groups too, since again, they are working all together. Um, but a few demonstrations of some ones that aren't usually used. Um, Pigeon stretch, you all know that again, if you, if you are, I am not doing well with all this stuff on here. Um, if you are a yogi, you are probably familiar with this one. Um, but I'm going to show a bit of a different variation of it. So pigeon stretch, especially if you have tight hips, not a bad idea. Use a yoga block, fold it 
blanket, place it underneath the hips, so that'll help keep the hips square. You'll get a more effective stretch that way. Now, if you're looking to stretch a different part, we'll say like the lower part of your glute, um, even into the high hamstring, bring the knee in a little bit more. Chances are you're gonna be able to square the hips a little bit easier. But again, if not, if the stretch is too intense or it's still not working the way you want it to, um, you can always uh, just prop your hip up there and then fold forward and you'll get a really, really, really nice stretch, kind of more like the inside and lower part of that glute there. Um, next, and so that one's the narrow pigeon. The next one, this is again one of my new hot stretches that, uh, that everyone is getting these days, uh, bound angle pose. So for this one, it stretches everything all over the hips, but then also gets a bit into the low back, outside of the hamstrings. So if you want a wall for this one, back up against the wall, so then that way that'll help keep your back straight. If it's hard to keep the back straight, you can always pop your hips up with a towel or a pillow or something. Feet together, knees out to the side, and then we just hold, okay? This is one that I like, my athletes to hold anywhere from two to five minutes, because it does take some time for this to kind of open up, and you might feel it immediately in one area, but then as you sit here a little bit longer, it'll start to open up in the other areas there. So you want to be able to have a full experience with this stretch. And in fact, with a lot of stretches, um, again, they vary per person. If one side tends to be a little bit tighter than the other. Maybe you spend a little bit more time on that side. Um, and you can hold the stretches a little bit longer if you need to and just do fewer reps if you find that your body kind of settles into that. So holding stretches a little bit longer, closer to like 60 seconds, things like that, will allow the nervous system to adapt a little bit better. Again, everyone kind of varies there, so we're obviously helpful, happy to guide you through that. Um, but just something, again, just kind of put in the back of your head. And then the last stretch I'm going to share with you guys is a personal favorite, uh, a pinwheel stretch. So this gets an area through the front of the hip, um, down hip flexor, your TFL, which tends to be really tight on a lot of runners, um, even right down to the quad. Now, if you know that you have a known hip impingement, this might not be the best stretch for you. Um, and again, you can always come up with the alternatives for this, but I'd say generally speaking, this is a great stretch for a lot of people. So I'm going to try to avoid any awkward angles here, but you're going to lie down on your back and then one knee is going to go in front of the other. And then you're going to let this knee drop down towards the ground. Here, so I'll just demonstrate what that'll look like. You can control how far back this leg goes and hold the stretch. So you can feel it anywhere from the top of the hip all the way down through the front. If this is a little intense of a stretch, or you find that it might bother your knee a little bit, change it up a bit. You can prop the knee either in the back or front or both of that works for you. Um, again, you can kind of customize it. This is another one that I recommend holding for at least two minutes if you can tolerate it, just to kind of soak in all of those benefits. All right, and then we have some running drills. What happened here? All right, there you go. Sorry about that. We got our running drills. Um, so again, this is hard to kind of guess what you are, um, what you may need, unless you get like a true gait analysis there. But I want to just throw in a couple that would be easy to do. So like kind of when in doubt here, um, skipping is a huge one. All right, helps work on the knee drive, your power to push yourself forward. Um, and of course, force, force absorption. Um, you can watch the horizon. So if you notice that if you're looking at the horizon and it's doing a lot of bouncing, chances are you have verticality. In other words, you might be using your calves a little bit too much to push yourself forward. So we want to try to smooth out that the horizon. So the horizon shouldn't move in front of you. And then another helpful thing would be using like a metronome, like on your phone or maybe downloading a, a playlist on Spotify, um, in which they have tons of them, which might be a little bit more entertaining than, uh, using a metronome and setting it to 160, 100, 170 beats per minute and trying to maintain um, that cadence while you're running there. Um, I'd say if you're a newer runner um, or one that 
might run a little bit on the slower side, start at about the 160 and then increase from there, depending on how that feels. All right. And then, um, and Dr. Whitney already spoke about this beautifully here, when to seek help. We are looking at if the three out of 10 pain thing that I've already talked about there. Uh, that's a big red flag. If you're noticing that, or like Dr. Whitney mentioned, if you start running and you have some pain and then that gradually gets worse while you're running, good idea to get things checked out. Um, if you are a runner that has previous injuries or recurrent injuries, um, if you're deconditioned either due to a medical condition or just generally being deconditioned, you've kind of taken 2020 off and you're looking to get back to fitness, good idea to, to get some help. Um, or if you're just simply looking to prevent injuries, you want to improve your solar performance or really just don't feel like you have any idea what you're doing, another great way to step in and, and see us there. And then here at the McKaylee Center, um, we offer a gait analysis. So what we're looking in that um, is we want to assess your running technique. So we're looking to see um, just generally what your running mechanics are for any like faulty movement patterns um, and working on correcting those so that you can run more efficiently. So we identify any strength, flexibility, range of motion or motor patterning deficits. Uh, we use a really fancy treadmill that has a force plate on the bottom of it. So we know kind of like how you're stepping on your foot, how hard you're landing, um, if you're crossing over, anything like that so that we can start to make those corrections there. Um, Sarah, I'm going to piggyback off of that comment for a second. So we actually have a promotion that begins today through the middle of April, which would be Marathon Monday. So through April 19th, um, we're going to do 15% off all running related programs, services and packages. Um, and that will be advertised through however you found out about the lecture. So social media, email, um, you'll see that come out over the next week. Awesome. Solid plug. Good timing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, come hang out with us and we'll, and we'll take a look at your gate at a discounted price. Um, and then what we do here is, yes, we all have our favorite exercises and things like that. I know I just threw like 5,000 of them at you there. But when you come in and work with us for your gate analysis, you're getting an individualized program. You're getting an individualized exercise program. You're getting individualized drills and a return to, a return to run program. Sorry for saying that twice there. Um, all of the stuff that we do is based off of research um, and and can just be hugely helpful whether you've been struggling with injuries or you're just looking to better your performance there. Um, another benefit is because we are very close with all of our sports medicine doctors uh, here at Children's Hospital. If you happen to be a patient here at Children's Hospital or an injured runner, um, we communicate with them directly. So uh, they know exactly what step of the process you are in as we are going through it. So when you have a follow-up, they know what you're doing, which I think is very different um, from some other gate analyses that, that uh, may be out there. And it's just great in terms of just communication for, for keeping you healthy and, and staying out there on the road there. And it's great for our runners of any age. Um, so if you're 12, come on and see us. If you're 120, I'd love to see that gate. Uh, but come in, we'll work with you there. All right. All right. Um, I think we're so going to, we're going to log off for now. We have a few questions, but I really want to be mindful of everybody's time. So I think oh, if sure. you have any questions um, that we didn't get to, feel free to email us um, through the hello at the McKayleyCenter.com, which is where you got your confirmation email for the lecture. Um, and then I can pass them on to um, whoever it's more appropriate to answer so that we can be mindful of our presenters time and the attendees that are here. Um, thank you for holding on with us. Um, and I think we can wrap it up for today. Are you guys good with that? Yeah, that was awesome. Thank you sure. so much, Sierra. It's amazing. Yeah. I just, I could watch you all, like it was incredible. Thank you so much. Um, that was, I learned so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks. And thanks thank everyone you. for joining us this um, Saturday morning. And yes, um, thank you, everybody. I had no idea how over here. I'm sorry. That's okay. Sarah, you could do this for two hours on your own and we oh, yeah, love it. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you to Nicole, Dr. Whitney and Sarah. Um, and if you have, again, if you have any questions that we didn't get to, please email me at hello at the And um, as long as this recorded correctly, this will be up available on our YouTube channel next week. And if you signed up for credits and you paid for credits, I will be reaching out to you as well. So thank you again for joining us. Um, we hope to see you around the McKaylee Center or if you're injured in Dr. Whitney's clinic, either one. Great hopefully place not. to start. Yes, but hopefully <laughs> not. Um, so thank you again for joining us and thank you to our awesome speakers.
Great. Thanks everybody for joining. Thanks so much. Thank Bye. you everyone. Bye guys. Thank you everybody. Bye.